agency. How's my agency business doing? <laughs> well, we're gonna get into that in a few seconds, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to beautiful Phuket, Thailand. Shout out James Hyde. We got a special guest in the house tonight. Oh, the shit. one and only high ticket drop shipping king of Southeast Asia, especially Bali and Thailand. <laughs> Joining you tonight, the top one and two digital nomad ginger kings of Southeast Asia. We're gonna get into it all. We're gonna get into digital nomad life in Southeast Asia. We're gonna get into starting in Chiang Mai eight years ago. Wow, it's been a long time. Now Trevor's crushing it. Still crushing it with high ticket drop shipping. Living that life out here. Spending his holiday locked in. What's that in top 10? <laughs> the one and only Trevor Fetter, ladies and gentlemen! <laughs> Oh, that was sick, dude. Dude, I had that idea. That intro was amazing. I had that idea. <laughs> that was I fucking had epic, man. <laughs> Holy shit. Test, test, test. <laughs> it's the coolest okay. podcast intro ever. I was moving this DJ thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, dude, why not just like open it, play it, <laughs> and like I'm introducing him for like a concert. I mean, it's just funny because I've never heard anything like that on a podcast before. Dude, neither have I. Impromptu. I mean, you know. Exactly. That's how dude, we do it. You're skilled, man. That, dude. What were you doing with that scratching, too? That was sick. I, I got to learn to scratch. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers, bro. A little bit of... Good uh, to see you again. A little bit of juice to loos loosen up the joints. Now that the uh, pandemic is over, we can see each other again, hang out, relax. Yeah. Pandemic is over. Let's oh. turn this thing off. Let's make sure audio is all good. So have it, as Rogan says, about a fist away from your face. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I don't so a little bit closer. <sighs> I can monitor the audio here. All my weird breath and Bam stuff. is not here, so oh. it's uh, I'm setting up all myself. It's not, it's not rocket <laughs> science. We're not, uh, we're not sending rockets to Mars here. It's just a podcast setup. But um, it is a lot of little things, though. Yeah, it's a lot of little things, making sure the you know, the stuff. focus is probably not perfect. Yeah, yeah. You know, right. um, the audio levels are probably not perfect. There's probably some echo going on. And so, um, yeah, so cool. what we got today, boys, is um, so, yeah, we met OG Chiang Mai. Uh, early days, 2015 days. Uh, did you go to Nomad Summit? Like, mm. or I mean, uh, Dropship Lifestyle? Mm -mm. No, conference? never went to their conference. No. Nope, okay. But, uh, yeah. No, I actually, I joined that in 2016. So it was a little bit after you guys went to Chiang Mai, I think 2014, right? 20 yeah, we yeah. went to the first right, right, right. Uh, Dropship Lifestyle retreat in 2014. Yeah. I was doing high ticket dropshipping back then, but... Make sure to keep uh, keep close to the mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I was doing it, but I wasn't a part of that group yet. So oh, interesting. Wasn't didn't even get introduced till 2016. Okay, uh, and so for those who don't know, okay, oh. high ticket drop shipping mm. is the business model that uh, we found, uh, that Parker and I found first via Johnny FDU's YouTube channel. Shout oh, out Johnny. Oh, he yeah. was the first like digital nomad channel we ever found. Um, he was doing Anton's course. He promoted Anton's course. Parker and I bought it. I remember it was for 500 bucks or no, it was, it was for 500 bucks or two payments of 300 on ClickBank, right? Probably. <laughs> no, no. And, I remember this. And, he, the first uh, thing wasn't dropship lifestyle. It was something else, right? It was like millionaires, something rather. that Johnny was promoting. No, no. Yeah. Anton's original course. It wasn't called dropship lifestyle. It was called something else. Like when he very first launched it in Chiang Mai, like 2014 or something or 2013 or oh, something. Oh no. Like I only remember dropship lifestyle. I forget where I saw this. It was like a YouTube video buried okay. somewhere, but yeah, it just, um, it's funny. Yeah. And so we got that course. Um, it was 500 bucks. It's now three thousand or five thousand. It's a really good course, but man. Um, I, I learned a lot. Yeah, it is. It it won like Shopify's best. Anton's course a really good coach. He's very smart, and he knows yeah. like what to focus on, what not to focus on. Yeah, I had him on the pod. He's improved um, it a lot too over time. You know, he's like he didn't just like make it and then leave it. Like it's yeah. actually gotten improved. So no, like yeah. I, it's it's beyond it's a course now. It's a whole online education. And it's uh, like a company. community too. Yeah, it's a lot of people. And community, involved. like he has a big office in Austin, and it's mm. like shops of life. You yeah. walk in, and it's like it's like a it's startup, crazy, and he's all about you know shopify teaching and so parker and i were so broke that um 
we had to do the two payments of 300 bucks. And so I remember, and we had to split it. Uh, yeah. you know, that's, that's the days when I was sleeping on the couch and all we wanted to do was go back to Thailand, park it a semester abroad there. So that's, that was our dream. Uh, and then, uh, so you've been doing high ticket drop shipping, uh, ever since, and, uh, you're still doing it. So yeah. What are the, yeah. what are the updates? How is it going? Still making money? Is it tougher? Is it just oh, yeah. like, do you love it or? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, man. High ticket still works. And, um, yeah, well, you know, there's always going to be more competition. I think one of the th biggest changes has been, you know, with the marketing platforms, the ad platforms and costs are going up with the ads, of mm -hmm. course. But I think one of the keys with high ticket is just choosing the right niche. You know, because if you choose a really highly competitive niche, it's going to cost more for ads, it's going to take more for optimization, you know, all that good stuff. So if you, what I do a lot is I try to research as much as possible to find the best niche, which is usually yeah. like something that has lower, lower competition, still a lot of suppliers, still good margins, that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, they're still out there, man. You're, I'm still finding them. You know, what's funny though, is that like, it's not even just about the niche. It's about the suppliers within the niche. Mm. and getting those suppliers, the really good suppliers, the brands that have like the best margins, you know, the best selling products, the top suppliers in that niche, which usually are the hardest ones to get. Mm. So, yeah, it still works, but it's not easy, man. You got to work a lot, just like so anything else. For, just because I want to give people a perspective because um, of how much you can make with high ticket drop shipping. So how many stores do you own? Obviously, you don't need to put out exact numbers or skip it if you want. Mm -hmm. How many stores do you own? Uh, and then like, what what's the business model? Do you like launch a store every six months and are VAs completely running it? So like you find the niche and then do you have like a, like a system that you do? Do you own like dozens of stores and like how much does each one make or like, and how much can you, you know, you make, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, in, in monthly cash flow? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it just depends. Like, like you're trying to allude to is that the scaling process can mm -hmm. be infinite, but at some level you have to realize like as, as scalable as these businesses are, it's probably not a good idea to scale past a certain amount unless you're actually ready for it because mm -hmm. there's a lot more involved once you scale past like a hundred thousand, 200,000 sales in a month, you for have to hire time. a bigger team. Yeah. There's more customer service. There's more complaints, there's so many orders, going. so through. many orders to process and more refunds, you know, more chargebacks, but you almost like at, at a certain point you have to hire a bigger team. You have to hire multiple teams and kind of like train people to be managers of those teams, like any business. And then you have to hire like a CFO because the, finances just get so complicated. You can't just oh, handle it yourself yeah. anymore. And especially with drop shipping, you usually use credit cards to place the orders. You can imagine uh -huh. if you're getting like 10, 20, 30 orders a day mm -hmm. or more, you know, how many transactions are going through the card? There's a transaction for every single $30, order. $30,000 a day Sometimes plus. there's multiple transactions because one order is composed of like multiple suppliers or something like uh -huh. that, you know? So it can get really complicated mm -hmm. the bigger it gets. So it's not all like dreamy and stuff you know think in your head i can scale yeah. this unlimited blah 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 but once no. it gets past that level it kind of gets a little bit crazy <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so okay cool and i guess kind of my next question is if you were to start over right now in the game the digital marketing game and maybe this could be to you talking to a younger uh, trevor fenner Word. in another universe what would you do to live this nomad lifestyle totally. and make make great money if i could talk to myself what not you know maybe like let's just say 10 years ago because that's sort of when i was getting started with this stuff it was like 2010 11 12. if i could tell myself one thing it's like start hiring people for the stuff that maybe you're good at but you don't want to do or maybe you're just not good at so you're mm. not going to do it but it's really important to grow your business you know one of the biggest mistakes I did was trying to do everything myself back in the day, you know, for the stores. Yeah. Like upload products. Yeah. Call suppliers, process orders, talk to customers, take phone calls from customers. It was a huge mess, you know? Yeah. And it was a lot of work. It was like all day long and I wasn't making that much money, but you know, I mean, it was all right. Um, if you hire people for product uploading, you hire people for customer service and supplier recruiting, you hire people for optimization and like just general, like, graphic, maybe graphic designs, another really good one, having yeah. professional graphics made and stuff for sure. 
there's a lot of little things you can hire for, but you know, start with one thing. Like I had a, I have a friend that did a, a store under my coaching program and stuff and I helped him build it. And the first thing he hired out was product uploading. Cause yeah. that was like one of the, yeah, the copy you know, and paste stuff. Yeah. I mean that, cause you just copy and paste in the beginning, but it's like yeah. so redundant. And then, you know, like you're going to sit around all day doing that. Like just hire a Filipino for three bucks an hour. They'll do it eight hours a day you know, 40 hours a week and they'll upload a ton of products that you probably would not never have uploaded yourself if you were just doing it yourself. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's scary and it's like kind of weird when you first go to do it. The most important thing with outsourcing is that you have good training materials for them and good Mm. processes and stuff. So you just Mm. have to make a video showing yourself how to do it, like how you do it. Mm -hmm. And then they'll basically repeat that. I mean, it's like, it's like you're building a computer program, but using a human to run it. (laughs) Yeah. 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 You know, human, human programs are (laughs) AKA VAs, not every VA, but do I, I joke with people all the time. I even say it to their face. Don't be a robot. Don't be a robot today. Nelson, Don't be a robot, Jack. Don't be a robot, Angelica. I'll say that because like (laughs) you said something that makes no sense at all or did something that makes no sense at all. But, 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 you know, it's, um, I'm not like being mad. That's how some people work. They're just like going about their day and that's what they do. They follow SOPs and they don't think, Mm. you know, to the next deeper level about Mm. it. If it makes sense, they're just, they're just copy and pasters. It's a big problem. But, um, so what are, what are some of the tricks to, this applies to really building any digital business, you know, in terms of hiring. So you said, mm-hmm. obviously find a good niche mm-hmm. and that yeah. goes with any business, yeah, yeah. whether it's FBA, private label, whatever. Yeah. It's all about the product and the supply and demand. Mm-hmm. That's huge. Any business starts. Why? Because of a good idea, a good product. Of course, that's uh, not too competitive, of course. And you have a reason for customers to choose you over the other millions of options that are out there. And so good niche, good hiring, um, systems. So looking back, building your, let's just call it e-commerce business, you know, whatever, doesn't matter what the flavor is, um, per se. Um, would you say, from the get go, you would have maybe just done the first store yourself. So, you know, all the processes Mm. record everything on loom, do one store. And then, all right, for the Mm. second store, this is going to be, I have a system now to do more of these stores to duplicate them easy. Yeah. That's a great idea. Actually. Yeah. Yeah, That's a really good way to do it. Cause if you get too carried away with hiring, um, obviously people aren't going to get trained properly probably. And you know, things might not get done right. I mean, I did a lot of experimenting in the beginning with hiring. Like I would use Fiverr sometimes and I would, you know, I, you have yeah. to find p- good people. Like, For sure. Yeah. You're never going to get the perfect person. Easy, I mean, yeah. sometimes you do. Sometimes you get really lucky and you yeah. find perfect people. You find you know? rock stars in there. You <laughs> keep them for five years. Yeah, and I've had a few. yeah, totally, man. And those kind of people are amazing. And that's just, uh, that's why I love hiring people. Cause some people, sometimes you find people that can literally take over all the headaches in your life for you, you know, and like it just frees you mm-hmm. up to do what you actually want to do in life. Um, and they work for, you know, such a small amount of money compared to what you would have to pay in the Western world, usually for somebody, uh, you know, similar caliber. It's crazy. Um, but nobody's ever perfect. And you're always dealing with humans. And people make mistakes, you know, so yeah. you just have to be like a people person. Just get used to that and be OK with mistakes happening and you can kind of like take responsibility for it in a sense. Like mm-hmm. if this mistake happened, don't just think, oh, you did something wrong. Think, OK how did I not train you correctly? Did mm-hmm. I, you know what I mean? Like I always go back to that with my VAs. If they do something wrong, it's not necessarily that they did something wrong. It's probably that I didn't train them. Right. So like I go back and I say, okay, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? You kind of check every point along the way. It's like troubleshooting anything, you know? And then you find the problem, the source of the problem. Boom. That's why like my, one of my last VAs gave him a video said, do this task. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he goes and does the task completely wrong. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking to myself, okay, what went wrong here? You know? And, I ask him, did you watch the video? Yes, I watched the video. Did you take notes on the video? No, I didn't know I was supposed to take notes on the video. Well, mm. that's probably why you're doing it wrong is because you didn't take notes on the video. Because if you don't take notes on the video, how do you actually process that information 100%? Yeah. You don't, right? Yeah. You just kind of like, you skim through it probably. You're just sort of watching it. You don't really process it. So that's why I have my VAs. Every time I make a video, I have them take notes, it, which basically becomes the process for the, like the checklist, the step-by-step checklist for that task. And I use that for other VAs in the future. And, and then they do it right. Perfectly right. hundred percent. So that's like the best way to do it. Um, 
you know, and, and having a, a team means you got to have a communication platform. You got to have a way to track their time and, and hours and, and what they're doing throughout the day. Um, there's all these different tools you can use. I mean, I obviously use spreadsheets, but um, there's Slack or Facebook Workplace, and there's all these other communication platforms you can use. Um, and then you need like a hub staff or something like that. Um, and then the more your team grows, you know, you got to create groups of people that talk to each other, communicate things. And uh, Trello is a really good tool for project management. You know, yeah. my team uses that and they love that because it just it gives them reminders and it has all the checklists and stuff and everything's there for them. OK, so you do Trello with spreadsheets for. Yeah, the, the sheets it's, it's, just kind of help organize. Yeah, it's um, hard to not use spreadsheets. For, I don't know. For some reason, I, I don't like Trello as much. I like spreadsheets more. And, and then the VAs like Trello more. So I kind of let them use that to because it, it gives them reminders. I think that's why like, the reminders. Yeah, you know, for that's the thing that sheets needs to build in. Real they really quick. do. Yeah, they, they don't do a but good they job. Will, it. They will. It's like kind of there, but not really, you know. And it, you can do comments. Yeah, exactly. And then it's like, eh, well, it's not, it's not enough. You know, you, you need, you need like due dates and, and alarms. Yeah, which and is stuff. why things like Airtable and smart sheets are coming along and, uh, mm. you know, Notion, which I'm on right now. Notion, and, you talk a lot about that. Yeah. Oh, psh, it's spreadsheets with, mm. mixed with uh, Trello, um, mixed with Google Sheets. Oh, cool. I gotta check it it's, out. It's crazy. I gotta do a huge video on this. Um, <laughs> not even sponsored by them, but. Um, yeah, they have an affiliate program. Maybe. <laughs> they're starting, they're starting to. <laughs> yeah, but I got, go. it, I got on Notion <laughs> three years ago in the early relatively oh, wow. early days and yeah. someone in a co-working space in Chengdu said dude just fucking do use this it's the best thing ever and so back to uh hiring i was looking up this notes on this free agency course on youtube uh, by this guy named tim Con tim conley i don't know um danny showed me this um this guy I found him been going through dozens of his videos taking notes and had a great one on training so first you demonstrate how to do it mm. Okay. Yeah. And then you do it. Um, so you demonstrate it via video and then you do it with them side by side. Mm -hmm. They are doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you're giving them notes and then they do it by all by themselves without you by the side watching it live. And then they send you the results and then you pick if it's wrong. And then to finally prove they learned it, they teach someone else they make their own training video, so to speak. Yeah. Okay, exp now you make your training video, record it, send it to me. You're not just doing it, but you're explaining, you're mm -hmm. teaching, you, let's say, your team member how to do That's it. Really smart. So the best way to learn, to prove that you know something is if they can teach it to someone else. True, true that. Bada bing, bada boom. Okay, so training. Um, What else we got here? We got, um, ba 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 man so we could get into miles points oh, shout out yeah. trevor mile method that too. We stock credit cards man yeah so <laughs> that's a good one one of the perks of high ticket drop totally. shipping is so customers pay you the the 3k for the big for the high sauna ticket, or something for the sauna yeah. or couch or, or yeah. cooler or dj or oven dj thing speaker whatever whiteboard table. table yeah tripod. Yeah, so, if you're wondering what niches to do for high ticket, just look around your house. Like you'll find a bunch. <laughs> and, and is the money home office is the up. big money in B two B? I don't know. There's big money everywhere. I'll tell you what though, they're completely different. You know, types of customers, consumers versus businesses. Mm -hmm. So I, you're either going to be good at one or the other. But um, if you have any background in B two B, definitely go for a B two B niche because you'll get really big customers, customers that reorder from you all the time. You know, yeah. and. Uh, that's, yeah. that's what if I were to go back in that high ticket, I would do B two B. That's yeah. just what I've heard, just from from guys like yeah, with so. with stores that blow up. Jacob, you just gotta think like what are businesses buying, you know? And yeah, the office equipment stuff is really good for businesses. And mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of industrial niches too, like like security equipment, things like that. You know, mm -hmm. safes and all that. Like businesses buy those all the time, mm -hmm. especially all the the cannabis shops in the U S. because they have to take cash, so they're mm -hmm. buying safes like crazy. They're buying like electronic locks and. Mm -hmm magnet locks and all this stuff you know so security is pretty good i mean highly competitive mm -hmm. it's, it's another example of like high demand good supply extremely high competition you mm -hmm. know and there's a lot of those unfortunately and so if there is high competition is there any trick oh yeah i mean you just you just try to be better than your competitor and that's not easily done you have to have a team to do it like the the biggest thing people come down to is the, is the price of the product yeah. if they can find it cheaper on a competitor's website they'll usually exactly buy it from if them, it's you know? the same make and model 
Why do they give a shit? So, like, so the thing that usually saves us is the map pricing, but not all suppliers have map pricing and sometimes competitors break it. And so I have a VA that one of her tasks is just to check competitors all the time on those products, especially the best sellers, you know, and make sure that they're following map and then report them to the suppliers if they're not. And so that usually tries to keep the playing level, <clears throat> uh, playing to field a, level. A VA checking the map pricing, reporting people. Yeah. So that's one of the tricks to, to fighting competition. The other one is just to provide more than what they provide. So if like they have um, lower prices, let's say you can offer free gifts, something like enticing or whatever, you know, yeah. uh, different types of free gifts. There's physical, there's digital, whatever you want to come uh -huh. up with, but like something for free. One of the things they used to do is if the product has like customizations already built into it, you can kind of take those apart and just list it as if you're offering it for free. It's a kind of a marketing trick, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. I, what's a good example, like a, like a home office setup. Maybe if that desk like already comes with a certain functionality, uh, like a standing desk already comes with a functionality to like raise and lower. You'll say it comes with like a free uh, raising and lowering digital keypad. Yeah, right? yeah, it's like of course it already comes with that, but it, right, it's you know what I mean. That's, yeah, that's yeah, one yeah. of these like little tricks People you like can use. Free, oh, free this, what? free that. Yeah, they just like seeing free stuff, you know. Got it. And then what, what has been? Um, so, this is a huge one. What's been the main source of traffic? Is it still Google Shopping ads? Is it? What is it? Pretty much, yeah. Because for high ticket usually you're looking for people that are in the market to buy it. And that means search intent. So you can't really interrupt people with Facebook ads for high ticket products and close a sale as well. Um, usually that works for low ticket stuff, um, impulse buy stuff under a hundred mm -hmm. bucks. But mm -hmm. yeah, for like a thousand dollars and up, you got to go with Google and so, and Bing, you know, or Microsoft, whatever. But so it's Google ads, shopping ads specifically, but also search ads. Like right now in my ad accounts, they're pretty simple actually three shopping ad campaigns, one for generic search terms, one for brand search terms, one for product and SKU search terms. And then we bid higher for the, like the longer tail search queries and stuff like that. Um, and then there's the dynamic search ads, which are really simple to set up. And then, you know, it just grabs every website web page from your website that's already ranking in Google. And then it basically automatically runs a search text ad for it to mm. match the query of that person. It's like the simplest, easiest way to set up search text ads. Instead of doing them one at a time, targeting specific keywords, you can just get it all out there with a, with a uh, dynamic search text ads campaign. Mm. And then the dynamic remarketing uh, display ads. Uh, dynamic remarketing Google display ads. Yeah, like eBay, it'll internet, show or something, weather.com, yeah. like they'll show like little pictures and of your products uh -huh. and people click through there. I oh, usually shit. try not to run them on um, mobile games and stuff like that. What about um, um, no. retargeting Facebook ads to close retargeters? Those work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But the Google ads has been the bre that's the bread and butter. Yeah, for for like cold leads and warm leads. Yeah. Um, also, another trick to making Google ads work really good is actually using their built-in audiences. So Google can track who's already been to your website. And mm. so what happens if people go to your website and they go back to Google to search again and they find more competitors, you know, is that you can actually set it to bid higher on somebody that's already been on your website or has already added to cart or has already placed an order from you. Cause if they already placed an order from you, they know and like you and trust you. And, mm. um, gotcha. <laughs> and so, uh, it's more likely if they search again for that product or a similar product or whatever, that they're going to click your ad. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I set higher bid adjustments on those audiences that have already been introduced to me. So warmer leads, you know, got it. Yeah. So that seems to work really well. Um, it's not possible for all niches cause Google ads has some categories. They don't allow that kind of stuff for like the medical category. They don't allow you to like remarket to people based on health products. Mm. <laughs> One of the sites I was set up was selling medical equipment, like expensive medical equipment for like mm -hmm. hospitals and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the problems I had was that they don't allow that those types of products to, <laughs> it's so annoying, man. Cause yeah. it totally kills the, the ROI of the ads, you know, yeah. and you can't even use your audiences, but it uh, is what it is. It's nice. Uh, so I want to ask about your, uh, your e-commerce paradise course. Is it a course? Is it a system? Blah, blah, blah. Update. Uh, I'm going to close that door so we don't get any mosquitoes. Oh, yeah, yeah, so two minute break sunset. real quick. Yeah, let's do that. That's why they taste so Okay, so back after two minute break, we back. snack. Um, so e-commerce paradise, that is your oh, yeah. um, your course. I mean, you were crushing it at one time. I remember we we're hanging out in Bali. Yeah. Uh, we did a podcast in Bali. If you guys want to watch that next, uh, we've done a few totally, podcasts man. before. I remember that. That was a cool day. 
Yeah, like on the on the beach. Went up to Chengu, met up yeah. by that big statue in the cafe and everything. Did like a live stream or something. Oh, yeah, YouTube live stream. That's right. <laughs> that yeah, was back so, when the Wi-Fi in Bali still kind of sucked. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's a lot better now. But <laughs> oh, okay. That was what? I don't even. Two thousand eighteen, no, two thousand nineteen, yeah, yeah. right? It was uh, eighteen and nineteen. I 18, was there. 19. Yeah, yeah. Um, or yeah. eighteen and twenty. Yeah. Six well, you were months. there in, in the early pandemic too. I did. Yeah, eighteen and twenty. I did six months since there. So how's e-commerce paradise? How's your course? I know you were doing like a done for you. We'll build the store for you type thing, which yeah. I like that business model. And yeah, you know, what's sure. the update? Yeah. Bringing it back, man. Um, I had to shut it down in early 2021, um, for personal reasons. Mm-hmm. I feel kind of bad cause a lot of the students like ended up getting kind of upset. So mm-hmm. basically what I'm going to do is all the people that had access are going to get access to the course when I created the new one. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, what ended, to explain that a little bit, what ended up happening is I had all these people copying my websites. And he's like, you know, if I'm going to teach people how to do this stuff, I'm going to do the best I can with teaching. And I kind of have to use my own sites as examples sometimes, you know, so. Oh, so like the free ones that you show, people were just like copying the niche? Yeah, no, I wasn't showing like demo sites. I was showing my own websites, like my uh, real stuff, which okay. is kind of a big mistake to make in the teaching world because then you end up getting copied because people just have no morals, you know? And people can p- compete with you. Yeah, it, I mean, it's like, I don't have any problem with um, you if you set up a competing website and you do all your own graphics and stuff. But if you're straight copying my graphics, oh, you know, and like, like copying my content, it's just like, yeah. it's really bad. So um, that happened like over and over and over again um, in early 2021, like three or four times. Uh, and it got I got so burnt out. My, my main business was growing so much. I just decided to kind of shut it all down and mm-hmm. come back to it maybe in a year or two. But that's Got the plan. Okay. I mean, it, it, this stuff still works, you know, and there's no reason why um, I shouldn't do teaching. I know so much about it, so I'm definitely going to get back into it. So yeah, probably like Q1, Q2 at the latest 2023, I'll have that running again with the full on course, high ticket drop shipping, and then the service done for you service. Um, also like an SEO service. Mm. Um, getting your uh, product pages ranked, getting your mm. collection pages ranked, blog posts ranked in Google first page for the keywords, you know, that kind of thing. I got really good at that. I have a team doing SEO for me now, so mm. it makes sense to offer that. And then awesome. I have an ad management side to it too. And um, yeah, you know, and one of the things I'm considering starting as well is a uh, call center. You know, once you get nice. used to hiring a lot of Filipinos and they can answer phones for almost any business, you know, especially similar ones and a call center business just kind of makes sense to do. So oh. Yeah. Nice. We got the masseuse coming through. <laughs> they can see it on that wide angle camera. Ho- oh, hopefully the iPhone 13 <laughs> is still running. That's right. Um, pro tip Thailand. There's this app. It's called relax R L a X and uh, about a thousand bot for 90 minutes. That's 30 bucks per 90 minutes guys. And they come right to your That's house so within cool. four hours. Damn. I love it. It's a great app. Do um, they offer happy it, endings? Um, <laughs> this app, I don't think happy ending. This, is a, this is a very professional app. <laughs> just kidding, um, man. <laughs> but um, it's Thailand, you know. I'm no, just, no, it's yeah, I know. <laughs> but, uh, or, 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 guys, you can go to um, just go to your any local massage place, and if you, someone you like, you can ask them to for their phone number, and they will come at any time. That's True. actually what I do. True. It's just a local shop and a shop that we like, and they have some good, some good strong massage. And so we, uh, <laughs> we just text them on WhatsApp and they come and it's like a thousand baht for two hours. And so I got oh, two, yeah. two hour massages already this week, Monday and Tuesday. That's so good <laughs> when you're bro, sore and working it's on so stuff. so good. Yeah. And, um, that's why you're doing the stretching too, right? You had someone like come and stretch you. Well, yes. And so also at your local Muay Thai, you know, shop. Muay Thai gym. If there's a trainer that's good, you can say train and train at my villa. You know, if you have a home gym set up, which not everyone does, but if you did, then yeah, man, they'll hop on their motorbike and they'll roll through. You just, you know, pay them a little extra. And, um, yeah. So hashtag can't do that. Paradise, ever. man. Hashtag can't do that in, <laughs> in the U S exactly. uh, well, you your money just goes so much further. Well, here. yeah, it's I love just, it. Yeah. You just, you can get things that you just can't get in the Western yeah. world with, with like an affordable price. hundred percent preaching to the choir here. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this is awesome. We can go back into e-commerce paradise because like now my agency is, um, it's a, you know, done for you, Amazon agency, you manage your store, rank your products, uh, high in Amazon. Um, but this next year I'm going to be building out, um, 
a course that's basically teaching everything that we do for a medium ticket for, uh, you know, uh, companies, clients, uh, people. Because you already had a course sellers. back in the day, but this is going to be like, like a updated. product research course. This oh, okay. is like if you're a brand or a seller, it's going to teach you how to rank high on Amazon, how so to optimize your page, how to optimize kind of. Amazon ads. And so, hey, if we're if you can't afford us or we're not, it's not a fit or whatever, we can offer you our um, medium ticket course teaches everything we do do it yourself course <laughs> so so danny uh danny carlson another uh changu amazon agency guy um did his amazon ads course and launched it for it's like a 1k course um and so he actually just sold his amazon company for for high six figures okay. high high multi six figures not quite a million he said but anyway i'm really curious about you know um this kind of uh you could call it, it's it's an agency, you know, and a course because right, you have all things. Oh, it's a, you have the done for you, you know, and you have the or it's just training videos. You you know watch and watch my videos and do it, and then also the community. So yeah. this Tim Conley Conley guy I was referring to, he says, you know, he's he has you know, twenty years of agency experience. Um, he's like, that's the best business model right now. Mm is you have the core service done for you, mm -hmm. then a medium ticket video course, mm -hmm. and then tied into the video course, maybe uh, a, a yearly or quarterly, a community, um, uh, or it's a, you know, pay for the course yearly and you get access to all these SLPs and updates and maybe live webinars, maybe a, you know, meetup, you know, once a year, um, so that mm -hmm. kind of medium ticket with the community. So companies keep with you, they get your updates and, you know, they can, um, you ask questions in the community and then the low ticket, whether it's like a, an ebook, $7 mm -hmm. or like a mini course, $97, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. That's the, t that's the classic, uh, expert secrets, dot com secrets, uh, set up yep. the, the value ladder. Yeah. It also that's runs it. in value ladder. That's it. Dude, I mean, that's that's. I read those books like cover to cover so many times, like three, four years ago. Okay, changed cool. my life, well, they're, man. They're passing it down through other YouTubers you, to me. If so. you guys haven't read those books, read them. Yeah, and you'll understand all the funnel stuff. It's, yeah, digital marketing one on one. Yeah, basically. the agency stuff really requires it because you have to have a funnel for the agency stuff. You know, mm -hmm. you got to have your lead gen. You got to have your lead generator. The the lead bait they call it. <clears throat> mm -hmm. You got to have your email list. Mm -hmm. You got to have your retargeting. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you can process the leads, have the calls close the sales, get them on a retainer, whatever you do, whatever mm -hmm. your business is recurring or just one time, mm -hmm. you know, like what I was doing was uh, one time done for you up front and then on the back end optional recurring services. Mm -hmm. But maybe, you know, if your business makes more sense for the re just straight up recurring mm -hmm. $3,000 for like a month or two or three or whatever mm -hmm. it is, you know, you just have to figure no, it out. Uh, like, it's like we have multiple clients with us for yeah. a year, two years. We have multiple that are two years plus. Oh, that's great. Uh, you yeah. know, it's, so it's, it's a long when it works really good store term, management. You got a good system going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but this guy also advocates for, you know, the, the one big chunk setups are also great too, with the optional, he calls it labor. Mm. Uh, because he, he, he calls the recurring stuff more commoditized. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's cause the money's made in the upfront strategy and setup, you know, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we were talking, I think the guy's coming in here next after me is the uh, doing high ticket sales. Um, and, yeah. you know, so if you guys haven't started with uh, agency and the whole funnel thing yet, you can jump in and get your feet wet with some other company that already has it set up and just close sales for them. Make good commissions, you know, because that's probably the most important part of all this is closing sales. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> everything else aside, like that's the most important thing. If you can't close a sale, why even waste your time with everything else, you know? So get some sales skills, start there. And then once you get good at that, then you can do your own thing. I had some uh, sales experience in my previous job. That's why I was pretty good at it mm. already was selling uh, locks and security hardware and stuff like that. Expensive, oh. like access control systems to businesses and things like that. You weren't so. doing door to door, were you? No, but yeah, okay. it was in, it was inbound sales, but, um, you okay. know, similar, similar thing, except the the leads were usually a little bit warmer door to door. I mean, I, I never got that crazy. That that's pretty sick, crazy. man. When you can get somebody past like breaking the ice with somebody and then, yeah. and then actually buy from you, that's a huge like barrier. <laughs> it's a breaking the ice. Yeah. Once you like, it's, it's one of the biggest skills in life. Right, is totally. icebreakers, yeah. aka communication, and breaking the ice is the first part to any conversation. Yeah, just um, having good personality skills with someone, skills. you know. 
Yeah, exactly. It's humor. just good, it's just good communication yeah, skills. Yeah, like it's just good communication skills and, and good door questions. to door door to door throws you right right in the wolves, <laughs> and um, you know well any any sales job but door to door I would say maybe especially. Um, so if you're a young hustler, I used to three years ago I'd say door to door go do it this summer yeah. do it but now I say go do high ticket remote sales and you can do that from home bro and make more. It's just like, I didn't even know about this three years ago. Do it from Thailand. Right? And, and Trevor Wright was even saying like, dude, that dude, Marcus, he is onto something. Like, <laughs> like it just makes so much sense. Yeah, like companies all sense. need these, these sales teams. Shit, I might do it as a side hustle. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. I mean, why not? <laughs> I'm actually in talks with a guy to do sales. He has an, an Amazon uh, thing, Amazon program. That's, it's a done for you Amazon um, reselling store mm. for 30K. And he does, and I found him on Upwork. Mm. I, saw, I saw his job post on Upwork. He's like looking for salespeople, 3,000 commission. Um, I was like, huh, let's check this out. And he has a Amazon reselling store, 30K setup fee, 10% commission. I was like, dude, I'll take a few calls That's on great. that. Yeah, 3,000 <laughs> An extra 3,000 a month. Hell yeah. You know, 3,000 a month would be, you know, why it's not something for, you're for already a, doing for a few calls and you know so much about you know yeah it's and like if you do you almost. can do three thousand if you do multiple calls a week you can do three thousand a week you know that's uh that's not bad that's amazing um so it hasn't started yet guys i'll, I'll update you. <laughs> it, we're still in i had another <laughs> talk with them last night but uh potentially potentially cool but you guys get the point companies high ticket courses they need sales staff and you can be anywhere in the world um taking zoom calls nowadays and that's what marcus he's coming in here um i mean that's kind of what high ticket drop shipping is in a Mm. sense it's like if you do it yourself with the sales calls i mean you're basically trying to sell a product that another company offers it's not your product oh you mean customers will call you yeah like if you take your own calls oh so you you could have a ten thousand dollar product or twenty or thirty thousand dollar product you have to close some calls on the phone if you want to you can you don't have to because if it's like a five thousand ten thousand dollars yeah exactly if it's like a very high client sure uh, and then you get like a 15 20 30 percent commission on that product sale so you'll keep whatever it happens to be which is usually a lot you have to pay shipping or something but at the end of the day you're probably making pretty good money i used to do that i um back in the day i had like a a guy who bought a ten thousand dollar product for me i ended up making like fifteen hundred dollars on it you know And, and the phone call was so short actually <laughs> he had already read my website <laughs> he looked at the product yeah. he knew everything about it he's he, wanted to make sure you're real he just wanted to make sure i was real and i was a cool person that i'd help uh-huh. him out and it worked out and he, he bought and like i closed the phone five minutes later i'm sitting at a starbucks all of a sudden ding i get the the sale notification stripe yeah. came through you know ten thousand dollars <laughs> i've never sold anything that much you know before and yeah it was like 1500 profit or something like that it was after shipping and everything yeah heck yeah so i mean it, it's very similar <clears throat> mm-hmm Wow, I didn't, I didn't even. So, didn't if you think that. about it that way, you know. You, yeah, there could be opportunity to. You high know, ticket for sales, whether you're high ticket, services, physical, high ticket physical products, yeah. Physical products, it's it's both the yeah, same. Any, Maybe anything that's, that, yeah. There are definitely are companies that hire inbound sales reps that re- work remotely that sell physical products that are very expensive. Right. And definitely. it's really like anything online that is so. more than, you know, a few thousand. So, yeah, exactly. Like, it, it, you just have to know the products, you know, in order to yeah. sell them, usually. Um, it really depends. But yeah, if it like if you're in a niche already with your job, so you know about those products and then there's either maybe the company you work for <laughs> has uh-huh. that position available or you want to quit and work for another company as an inbound sales rep. I mean, yeah. There's uh-huh. lots of possibilities out there. So get creative. Yeah. Guys. And um, you know, as time goes, people are going to get more and more comfortable buying things online, for example, you want to buy a Tesla? Okay, it's fifty thousand dollars. You can just order online. There's no phone call That's unless true. you want to, but people get more comfortable with it. This brings up a fun fact of the podcast, guys. The most expensive internet e-commerce order purchase in history was how much do you think it was? It was a million dollars. What? I was, was gonna say like a hundred, maybe one hundred twenty. Th- twenty years ago, uh, maybe fifteen years ago, in the early days, by Mark Cuban. When he ordered oh, yeah. a, it was like a jet. Or private something. jet. It was a private right? jet. I think I remember. I saw story. an interview of him ra- randomly on Wait, YouTube. Wait, but seriously? I mean, that much money online? Yeah. Who the heck is selling private jets online? Uh, it was an interview and That's it was crazy. like, it was like 10 questions for Mark Cuban or whatever. But, but he's a dot com guy. And so he was. Imagine the merchant fee on that order. And, um, 3%. All right, let's do that. I, I think a friend sent it, sent it to him like, hey, here's the jet. It's listed for sale. And he just like. A $30,000 merchant fee. <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> processing yeah. fee? Yeah, processing fee for the right. credit card. Dude, <laughs> I hate Stripe. I'm assuming you credit card. <laughs> and so is Stripe down to 1.5% for you? No, well, yeah. No, I use Shopify payments, which works with, works with Stripe, and it's like two point something, you know. Isn't it crazy yeah, how much money they take? Obviously. Yeah, exactly. Well, when you're doing like, let's just say a half a million a month, which... It's like when you look at your services, it's like, oh, which subscriptions am I paying for? 12,000, you know, and it's like the most expensive fees. service that you use <laughs> is Stripe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's a, it's a they're the, of they're the company that's taking the most money from your company. Yeah. No, I'd say Google is the one taking the most money from my company. Oh, from ads. <laughs> but that just happens to be because I run ads. That's not for everybody. But yes, you're uh, right. Stripe is like. True, but that can end up being a positive ROI. No, that's true. Yeah, absolutely. But Stripe takes money. Stripe takes money whether you. Like, yeah. it's just like a, just all like they a, do is they process fee, it's there. And like, we're in the wrong business, man. We should be processing credit cards. Exactly. <laughs> Let's like start how much money does that really take to, <laughs> it takes, it takes zero money. Let's be honest. It's all numbers. It's electricity. Damn. How, you know, but anyway, that's mm. why crypto, hashtag crypto. I might have to get into the startup world now. <laughs> about this credit um, card pay- processing. But you know, PayPal, you know, Elon Musk. There's not enough competitors for credit card processing. I mean, there's a lot, but like. Not enough good ones, you know? Dude, you know what I heard Elon Musk just say mm. in, a, in an interview that I just watched? He's like, um, he's like, yeah, um, back then we had this whole mission for X.com to become, you know, the ultimate payment platform, but we, it never implemented and I sold PayPal and that's what I'm going to do with Twitter. <laughs> he said, I'm going ex- to implement the original X.com pl- game plan. Oh, okay. So he, he's, think, he's up to some big, some big crypto integration shit. Way more possibilities, yeah. I, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's so simple. Yet, if you can use the same app to do all the all sorts of other stuff, why wouldn't you? Yeah, you why know? not? It's like, yeah, we're on Twitter. It makes life can, so much easier. We, we should definitely talk credit cards more. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Such a fun topic. I love that topic. It's so it's so sexy, right? And it, yeah, exactly. It's, it's so mysterious. People are like, oh, well, credit cards. I don't credit know. cards? Is that illegal? Uh, it's so bad. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> supposed to have credit cards. How many miles do you have? How many millions <laughs> of miles do you have? <laughs> Oh my Trevor, God. Trevor, e-commerce paradise. Yeah, man. Uh, all right. I don't know. I, right now I've got like three or 4 million miles, but I think I've accumulated like well over 10, 15 in the past couple of years. And it's all from business spend mostly and uh, credit card sign up bonuses. <clears throat> okay. But you're, so with your dropshipping business, you're, you're processing, you know, tens yeah. of thousands oh, yeah. per month. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why. Yeah, like hundreds of thousands hundreds per month. Hundreds of thousands a month. Yeah. So, it, you know, okay, so there's the Stripe fees, but you also get almost the same amount back in either cashback or, or airline points, uh, sure. you know? So that's why I use credit cards for dropshipping. kind of makes up for that. Right. Um, so, you know, you're t- if you're... Okay, so it, a drop shipper that starts off maybe 50000 a month is a pretty good goal to get to. So that means your credit card fees are going to be around 1500 bucks a month. Mm-hmm. But with that same, let's just say your average margin is like 10%. So you make, you know, 45000 years of cost of goods sold or something like that, maybe a little bit less. Um, but you put that on a credit card, and some of these credit cards get like 2% cash back. So right there, that's 800 bucks, an extra 1000 bucks a month every 50000 in revenue. Um, if you do 100000 a month, which is not uncommon now, Mm-hmm. Um, and you get 2% cash back. That's $2,000 extra a month. But oh. if you get these airline points yeah, um, and you can get like cards with two X airline points, like the capital one spark miles card, um, and they're transferable to the programs. Yeah. That's where it's really cool. Where it's the one-to-one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so like for, for beginners, all right. So hundred thousand points, um, in general is worth about roughly a business class one way from us to Asia. Yep. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it depends on the time of year. And so and you're like, you're getting yeah. one business class from U.S. to Asia every single month. Yeah, exactly. And you, like Singapore Airlines or where you know it just it changes on your routes. Like, but yeah, Singapore has a really good program. Um, I like Canada Air because they have so Air many Canada transfer is, yeah. pro- program uh, transfer partners. So yeah, they work with like Turkish Airlines. They work with um, A and A Air. I think A and A. Yeah, I don't know. There's, yeah, I have I actually a whole thing ANA. downloaded. Um, yeah, no, I, I have it all. I have it all dialed in uh, on my mile method um, spreadsheet about which, which like Amex is partnered with these airlines, so it's one to one. Chase is partnered with these, so it's one to one, miles to miles, and that that's basically all you need to know. The one with the most transfer partners is Amex, though. Yeah, Amex. So those points are probably more useful. It really just depends on like 
you? Like, where do you want to fly? So, so you're in like Bangkok, Phuket, you fly to Seattle. So that route is usually covered by like Singapore airlines or yeah, Singapore air, Eva air, air Canada, air Canada starting, um, in December, 2022 actually is doing a direct flight. Mm. Vancouver to Bangkok nonstop. Oh, wow. How many hours is that? Like 14 or something? <laughs> um, even more. I think maybe like 16. 16, yeah. Which is arguable. I mean, <laughs> some people would argue, oh, I'd rather do the eight, eight leg yeah, and I the 10 leg. So too. you get a break yeah. for an hour Honestly, to walk around. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's arguable because... Yeah, it can get weird. I did the, the long trip after once. the twelve hours. It, it wasn't as great as I thought. I went from uh, Bali all the way to New York, uh, direct. It was sixteen hours or something like uh-huh. that, or eighteen. I forget. But it was just too much, man. Yeah, it's a little you bit. You know, weird. gosh. I, 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 like you said, I prefer the the ten hour, business seven class hour thing. Though. Yeah, business class. Yeah, of course, business. And by the way, <laughs> if you ain't flown business class, <laughs> come on, bros. All right, this is just like talking to my old self right here, and like, and you, yeah. dude. Like, if you're American, what we're going to be talking about, and after this, watch the podcast with Trevor Wright, not to be conferred, <laughs> confused with Trevor Fenner here. They're good <laughs> friends. We're all three good friends. Trevor Wright is at Mile Method on Instagram. Mile Method. He's the points guy, and he tells you exactly what credit cards to sign up every quarter, about two per quarter, and you collect the sign up bonus miles, which is around fifty to 100,000 usually. That is every single quarter. Let's say you sign up for two of those. You get two business class one-way flights from U.S. to Asia. Or if business class L.A. to to New York, that's like you're going to get four every quarter. Mm -hmm. And so now I fly business class everywhere. And it is a game changer because if you don't know, and not everyone realized this, you can lay flat and sleep in the bed. The thing goes down and it turns into a bed. And so it's now like a 12 hour flight. Who cares? I'm going to be sleeping for eight of it. And, and you know, free alcohol do a little, <laughs> there's free alcohol. There's so many and like do a little, you know, you know, cannabis edible or whatever thing you need to do. Oh, fuck that. But okay. even, even I've done without any edibles, <laughs> it's, it's a nice bed. You can sleep just fine. Just figure out your earplug situation and your headphone situation. If you get some good earplugs and then put, you know, because you can't really sleep with the big headphones on, but figure it out or do whatever you need to do. Some people, they want to take a sleeping pill or like whatever. Like my mom, she does edibles. Mm. Weed edibles are, are great for the plane. You're out and then you wake up and you're like ten, eight, 10 hours later. And it's like, we are going to be descending. And it was just, I just flew across the world. Holy shit. Like, <laughs> And it totally changes your mindset about like flying home for the summer. Okay, I'm flying home for Christmas. Business class is a game changer. I gave my mom, uh, we paid for me and Parker's mom's, uh, we paid for our mom's round trip business class flight. She's like, oh, game changer. Yeah, it really so, does. These long flights, it's just so rough doing coach. You know, you can't really move your feet around. You can't sleep. Yeah, and like what, I, what I historically Ugh. did is so my mom actually invented a travel um a seat sleeper thing you've seen it that thing's it's an elastic elastic strap that goes over the headrest and allows you to like strap your head in so you can sleep actually like that without bobbing down that's actually uh, i have some in my house but uh shout out seat sleeper available on amazon Um, shout out mom she could be watching this leave a comment if you are hi mom um (laughs) i would do that and every few hours i would get up walk down to the back um kind of you know uh, area open area where the uh, people work uh and do some stretching just stand up for a while do some calf raises i'll I'll, Uh, i'm crazy i'll do some squats some air squats and like some yoga type stretching stuff and then go back and then watch a movie and then maybe take a nap and then rinse and repeat Um, but you you got to get up you know and walk around and do some stretching Oh, that's a pro tip. And then another pro tip, so I'm, since I'm just laying them on you, right when you arrive in a new time zone, try to go straight to the hotel gym or wherever and get that adrenaline up because after the flight, you usually were tired and mm-hmm. what do norm, normally people do? I'm going to go take a nap, mm-hmm. right? But that will actually um, lead to more uh, jet lag. Um, if you can get boom right in and fight through that don't even unpack just get your gym stuff on 
go do at least a treadmill and a little workout and then you'll get boom acclimated mm. um anyways back to the point bros if you're american and you're not flying business class you are what are you doing it's so easy it doesn't cost you anything you just sign up for two credit cards every quarter, collect the credit card bonus points, 100K each. That's two business class flights, US to Asia, every every three months, okay? You meet the minimum spend, which is around like usually 3,000 in the first three to six months. Very easy to do that. If you need help with that, there's tips and tricks that you can do. And then never use the card again. Break it in half if you want to. Done, repeat that every three months. And Trevor has a spreadsheet system that I've showed you guys many times where he fills this out for you one by one based on where your credit card score is, based on what you've already applied to, based on there's hundreds of credit cards out there. He tells you exactly what to do. And also, huge bonus, I've been denied a few times for whatever. He gives you a script of exactly what to say. You call the next day and then they instantly approve you because of what you said. Oh, I was calling about the, oh, I'm applied. Oh, blah, 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 blah. Have you ever had to do that? Yeah, it works. Uh, yeah, I've had to do that. And then you're instantly applied. So it's, crazy. it's um, anyway, and I was, he was the over. Time they just want to make sure that it was just you applying. That's all they want to know. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's very, very, very interesting. Yeah. And so he, he's been doing this for years. Uh, he's been traveling the world forever for free. He was over here the other day um, coming by to say hi. We're going to be on a pod so you can guys can watch that next. Um, and um, what he said was, oh, yeah, I was going to say his, his program. So he just did a big webinar and hmm. just got a bunch of new clients. Yeah, I know. He's and so, which it. was awesome to see because I always tell him, promote your shit more. So great. And so basically the thing is, bros, I want to tell you is his his service, done for you service, is only going to be open a few times a year now. He's like, that's what it's coming to. I'm going to do a few few webinars a year, a few openings per year. Uh, if you stay for the the webinar, you're going to get you know a little bit of discount, but you have to join the waiting list now, bros. That's what it's uh, coming down to. So go to his website if you want to join the waiting list. You you sh you should be traveling business class free. Nothing. There's nothing illegal about it. It's just it's just the game. It's just the game. Yeah, it's all, it's too easy once you learn how to do it. But you just have to learn how to figure it out. There's yeah. there's getting the points, and then there's learning how to use the points really right. well. Right, and that's that's half of his service actually yeah. is. Yeah, he offers a service for getting the points, and then one for using them. Yeah, it's really yeah. Cool. So <laughs> for using them, like his his core yeah. services, he will basically find the best flight for you with the miles that you, you which have. takes a ton of time to research yeah. it's ridiculous i've, I've done yeah. this on my own plenty of times but he what he does is he uses the airline point programs which will get you a way better value for your points you know so like for instance if you try to use the chase portal or capital one portal you have like a 3x points or something card that you can use in the portal um you're only going to get expedia prices because that's mm. basically what they work with you know mm. but these airline point programs they'll give you way better value so the same points will go like double or triple even, yeah you know you can i mean you can get first class tickets mm. for almost the same cost as a business class ticket it's just hard to find them sometimes yeah so, so it means like it's you, a lot of research he but. you got to book directly on the airlines website yeah. using the directly airlines points and you can transfer them from the credit card program right. that you, so there's yeah. chase points there's amex points and then there's like city points capital those one, are the, capital points, one. Yeah. those are the three main main four yep. and then Marriott you, points as well and then actually, the way to get the the most bang for your buck transfer them to the airline points directly and then book through the airline um and then, so that's what he does for you because there's different airlines you could transfer to and the airlines have different routes and then uh, yeah, he, and he doesn't dates charge available, a fee. And there, just, there are some blackout dates available yeah. for business class. It's not available for every flight. Well, yeah. Sometimes it's full. It's been pretty bad this past year too because mm. the, the COVID pandemic disappeared and then everybody wanted to travel. Yeah. So like yeah, I was all having a hard the availability time. disappeared. Dude, he spent like two days like <sighs> looking for my best flight back to Asia. Like, and so yeah, it's been pretty the day bad. he was telling me like the days of that are over, he's hiring a team yeah. and yeah. Yeah, he was talking to me about that last night. It's like the, the research process takes so much time. You have to hire somebody to do it. There's just no way you're going to do that yourself all the time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, 
I mean, yeah. it's an awesome system once you research and figure it out. I mean, you got to figure out what cards make sense for you with your spending habits. I think that's the most important thing because if there are mm. cards that have good sign-up bonuses that you can keep long-term, that's the ideal thing. Some of them have high annual fees, so you don't want to keep them long-term. Yeah. But those usually the high annual fee cards have really good credits that you can use against those annual fees. So yeah, yeah. like they'll they'll make sense anyways just to have. Maybe it costs you like 50 bucks a year or something, but yeah. you get like a priority pass card with a lot of these that gets you airline lounge access, you and know. And, platinum. Yeah, or, or the the chase uh, reserve the sapphire reserve um some of the like high-end other high-end amex cards have it like the the uh, hilton aspire or the marriott yeah brilliant i have it right here if uh if sri wants to screen record this hilton amex hilton aspire it's, it's right here card, yeah <laughs> and they give you it says uh, two free nights per year at a hilton it's and a 250 sw credit 250 hidden credit Priority pass membership, which is worth a hundred bucks a month, yeah. and Hilton Hilton Diamond status. It is a really good hack for getting that airline fee credit as well, which still works. But if you just go onto United's Travel Bank, they call it the Travel Bank or whatever, you can buy fifty dollar gift cards for United at a time, and it'll code as if you were paying for like a drink or something on a United flight, because they they only want that airline fee credit to be used for incidentals. But it, you can buy United Travel cash on their Travel Bank, fifty dollars at a time. It'll, they'll think that you're buying something on a flight or something and they'll reimburse it. So these oh. cards, like the $250 a year, some cards, $300 a year. Oh, is that cards. the Southwest Airlines credit? Yeah, he, he was doing it with Southwest at some point. But um, I told him like what I did was I just went to Travel Bank and did $50 at a time because I read that online, it still works. Oh. And that works too. So now I have like a thousand bucks of like- United. United, yeah, United Travel United Bank is, cash. Is, is a big one. Yeah. Oh, so the credit means like uh, buying drinks on a plane. Yeah. Ah. Or, or paying for baggage or something like that. Okay, yeah, yeah. got so it. So normally you can't buy flights and get that reimbursed. I learned that the hard way one time. Got it. I was like, oh, I can buy a Delta flight. Cool. You got to set it to Delta and all that. And then I, I didn't see the credit and I called them. Um, what's going on here? Oh, yeah, no, it's not for flights. It's for incidentals. Baggage, drinks, other whatever. stuff, stuff other than seriously. Flights. So the best thing flights. to do with the Amex, uh, the Platinum or whatever, is to, is to set it to United, choose United, and then just buy the travel bank cash once oh. a year. That works. Fifty dollars at a time, though. You can't buy more than that. United Travel Bank yeah, Airlines. Might as well, because you know that's just nice. I want yeah, yeah, nice. Free cash, basically. Because I mean, who who flies Southwest that flies business class? Nobody. Yeah, is Southwest you're, still an airline. No, it's it's like the it's like the Greyhound bus of the of the sky, you know. Yeah. So I mean, it's cool if you just do like little um, city to city hops, like L.A. to Vegas or something. And you don't really care, yeah. you know. I used to it's fly a, yeah. Southwest back in the day, but MX Aspire. United says, is nicer, I, you know. United, Delta, American. I like the. Yeah, Alaska. Those are my favorite domestic U.S. airlines. Mm -hmm. Out here, obviously, it's a whole different selection. You know, you got uh, Singapore Airlines. You got in Indonesia, it's Garuda. It's like the top one. I think Thai Airways is like Thailand's top one. Mm -hmm. AirAsia is like the kind of middle yeah. ground, not like the super budget, yeah. but the middle ground one where you yeah. have like a decent selection. You kind of customize it, get meals if you want, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But, the, but the airplanes don't have, you know movie screens or anything on the, on yeah. the seats you know have not, you done air asia with points you, you can do it yeah I think you I can saw. yeah yeah big they're big points or whatever no i've never used points for air asia though but can they transfer from any uh programs uh i, I don't know I, I definitely looked into it um I don't think so. but anyways for reference like a flight from bangkok to phuket is like 50 bucks guys and you wouldn't want to do that anyways to, man you'd want to save points 90. for like etihad emirates that yeah. kind of stuff like the really high end stuff yeah so i i always pay cash for my um for the smaller for like, flights from Bangkok yeah. to Phuket, it's like fifty to ninety bucks. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like last minute, it's gonna be like ninety bucks. It, points yeah. will go further when you're spending them on long haul business class. That's what I found. Yeah. Like the redemption value goes much higher. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For some reason, I yeah, don't know. You can get screaming, screaming deals. For, for like one hundred fifty thousand points, you get that round trip business class to the U.S. And yeah, Paris. yeah. Round trip business class, one hundred fifty thousand. Crazy, you know? It's yeah. like I don't know. You'd pay probably three to four thousand dollars right now or something depending on how far in advance you book it. But mm -hmm. with these points, it's like, and so you can get a round dollars. trip just by two credit cards, basically every three months. That's a round trip business from us to Asia every three months. Pretty much. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. And so I've, I've already taken, you know, I've got five, 30 credit, 31 credit cards right now because of my yeah. business, but yeah. Uh, See, 31 <laughs> credit cards, guys. It's like, <laughs> yeah. there is no limit, <laughs> Dude, no yeah. law. To the number of credit cards you can have I open. I mean, the, the annual fee is like some god-awful amount that I'm paying in total with all these cards. Uh, but it makes sense because of my business. But 
Right. He, you have a spreadsheet and you yeah, track like it. 3,600 for all my business it. cards, 2,600 for all my personal cards. So it's like over $5,000 a year in annual fees. But all these cards have credits that go against the annual fees and or like reasons yeah. that I have them. Yeah. There's like, yeah. Most of the airline meal credits. There's Uber credits, Lyft credits, uh, yeah. um, Hilton credits. Like, and you don't have like, to have cards with huge annual fees to get the bonuses too. There's a lot of them that have like small annual fees, $95 or something that don't have a ton, but you'll still get like a hundred thousand points or something like that. Yeah. Those cards are great as well. And they're usually like the, the boutique, the niche cards, like the airline specific ones, the, that Alaska card or like mm. Aeroplan has a card, you know, Hyatt mm -hmm. has a card, Marriott has a card, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And hotel cards are totally different from airline cards, by the way. Mm, but I yeah, love right. hotel cards. Because right, then they're hotel cards. Then so, you're staying at five-star resorts and yeah, stuff. Yeah, so you points know? also work, bros, if you don't know, for staying <laughs> at hotels. That's why yeah. Trevor Mile Method always stays free for hotels. And they're not just like budget hotels. You know, when I first started traveling out here, it was always like, okay, 30 to $50 a night. That's what we can budget. And then we'd end up staying at these kind of crappy places. But, but now it's just five-star hotels, villas, yeah. you know, what, Dude, they need Airbnb needs a card. I know. Why doesn't Airbnb use points, man? <laughs> oh, man. Up. Once they do that, man. Well, I mean, they kind of, it's just through their referral program. So if you're like refer people to Airbnb all the time, you can get credit with them basically. But it's not the same. Yeah, for, for new customers though. Yeah. Yeah, so exactly. It's, like, eh, I mean, it's I, limited, I, I have, very limited. I have two accounts, I think maybe, but. Yeah, I mean, that's true. You create a new account and you get 30 bucks. Like, Airbnb right. you can get some sick places that you just can't get with a hotel like something like this you know mm -hmm. so yeah I mean a hotel you can, you can get sort of close to this but it's nothing like it I mean this is a, this is a freaking this is a dream <laughs> dream mansion <laughs> how did how did you come upon this is it just like well, one day you woke um, up and you're like we should live in a villa and pick it. <laughs> well I mean you know I've you, you guys have all seen me live in many villas throughout the years. Um, and in, in Bali, I lived in two different hustle mansions. Um, and I actually lived in a couple of villas, uh, by myself. I lived in a pretty nice villa. I was playing three, this was during COVID three K all by myself. Um, I had actually a girlfriend at the time, the uh, Bali girlfriend at the time. It was just me and her yeah. living there. Yeah. And it was the first time I've ever like, lived in a fucking house by myself like normal rate rent would be maybe like 6k or 5k it was covid got for 3k i was like you know what this is screaming covid deal and i love this mansion like let's do it like that's spending money on experiences is some of the best you know money you can spend like three thousand dollars all right let's say one way business class okay that's just like a one day experience or three thousand dollars you can get a whole month in your own villa house like that's just some of the best lifestyle investment, you know. I agree. Yeah, that's worth it. It's uh, you know, where, where where you wake up every morning sets your whole mood, sets your productivity. I, I filmed so many dope videos there. You know, I did podcasts there. You know, with like multiple guys and a setup. Very, it's a very similar vibe to this. Um, good days, good days. Bali has good energy, man. There's a lot of people there all the time and a mm -hmm. lot of things going on. Yeah. A lot of you know, surfing, a lot of like nature and stuff like that. Bali is a lot of partying. It's hard to beat it. <laughs> and so we could get into like Bali versus I Thailand versus did. Phuket. Totally. And so what I am, I've been in Phuket now one year. All right. The first six months is at our other villa. Super sick. Now we've been six months here already. Phuket is the closest thing to Bali. Uh, that I've seen Phuket is the Bali of uh, Thailand um, in that you get the tropical great beaches vibes and you have the world-class nightlife okay the super clubs yeah. the big names yeah, yeah. coming through like Steve Aoki and the big DJs you have that here you don't have that in Koh Phangan mm. Koh Samui other okay. island destinations in Thailand you don't have that but Bali gets all the big names coming through in terms of nightlife and, and music. If you're a music head Definitely. and you like nightlife yeah. and in terms of world-class community, entrepreneurs, expats, creatives, DJs. And, uh, I mean, Phuket is the, it's the number one tourist destination in Thailand. And so you have all of that. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's, it's big. It's like, it's bigger than Bali. Uh, I believe in terms of like size and uh, and population and everything, um, and so 
that's what I would compare to. And before I came here, I only thought of Phuket as like <laughs> Bangla Road. Oh yeah. And yeah. so don't stay in Bangla Road. That's like the the kata. It of, depends. Of Maybe Bali. that's what people like. You know, I don't know. Well, it's it depends on what you like. If There's you're all digital, different if, sides. Well, like, if you're a digital nomad, um, I mean, that's like the the crazy. That's like the the touristy. That's like where all the the first timers. That's just like where the, like party, the travel bro. companies yeah. companies just they'll just throw you there by default. You'll just be thrown in Patong Beach. Right. But for digital nomads, it's all about Rawai, which is like a Changu type beach place, Rawai Beach, and then also Bang Tao Beach. Um, which is yeah, the party scene can Beach. be a little bit distracting when you're trying to work <laughs> remotely. Well, I mean, I just I just had a uh, <laughs> podcast with Matt uh, last week on this couch, and we were talking all about balancing party and work. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, you know, my general thing is just like, yeah, party on the weekends, like normal people, and then. But also, like you, you, you tend to take on what your surroundings are. Like if you surround, yeah. if you put yourself in that place, you're gonna be way more distracted than if you're in Huawei and you're not in the party scene. You're more like. True. If you're surrounded by other, if you're blocks working. away from parties going on, but like at the end of the day, like it's up to you, dude. Like you choose what you do with your life. Like, <laughs> are you gonna be have some self control? <laughs> yeah, it's like self control is up to you. What do you want me to say? <laughs> yeah, it's up to you. Like, so, it's like I'm trying to do. It's like Tuesday night, doing work. <laughs> oh, I see some. Oh, I see some party going on over there. I hear some music. Oh my God, I need to go, I need to go party. Like that's your own fucking problem, dude. <laughs> Yo, what are you talking about? Like, that's, it's so hard. The like, struggle is real, man. It's, it's not hard. Like, what do you, what do you mean? <laughs> like, do you have some weird addiction? It's just easier if you're farther away from it. If you're physically, okay, if it's physically hard to get to that place where that happens. I think the more, the more definitely thing addiction. that has to do with it is who your friend groups is. Oh yeah, that too. Of course. Because yeah, partying is a social people. thing yeah. I mean, for most people, right? Um, and then you're going out and just like getting hookers all the time by yourself. <laughs> um, but <laughs> party is the, is the thing you do with your friends. I, it, Thailand's a great place for people that are very social, and it's also a really good place for people that aren't very social. Yeah, they, they have like they're open to everybody. They don't. It's the they sex tourism you. industry, yeah. which is you a can, huge thing. That's like I never talk happy. about it because it's like it's a whole different you know, crowd. It, it's a little bit faux pas, like yeah. But I mean, it's just it is what it is. Like uh, yeah. you see a ton of people coming out here, and that's the only reason they come out here. Yeah, is take advantage of all that stuff. And and there's a lot of women that work here in the industry, and like yeah, that's actually you know one of the ways they can make decent money because what else can they do? Like yeah, work on the farm or something like their family business. Probably not going to be that much money, and you know, whatever. I, yeah, you know. It's, um, you know, like, like in America, anything. there's strippers. Like it's the same thing. Yeah. It's just, it, it, it's just different. You know, yeah, in America, there's escorts, there's yeah, strippers. escorts and stuff. You I know? mean, yeah. Fucking prostitutes. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's just out here. It's a little bit more like relaxed. It's yeah, like a little more, bit, yeah. a little bit more, more open, like, and relaxed. open and stuff. If you look, look at a place like Germany, that's a great example. Cause prostitution is mm. legal in Germany. And they have oh, really? huge brothels and stuff. Yeah, oh. absolutely. Like in Cologne, they have like a super brothel. Um, yeah. In uh, in different parts of Germany, there's brothels. You walk in and spend all day there. Interesting. You know, have sex a bunch of different times with different women. Like, mm. whatever. Okay, so it's a very European thing, actually. Mm. And where did all the white people come from in the world? <laughs> Europe. Mm. <laughs> I mean, you just watched that video with Johnny Harris, how Europe took over the world. Yeah, we're just Europe. We're all Europeans. We, we all we're, came from just Dutch Europe and whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, back in the 70s, 60s, 70s, Thailand really got its start out here because the uh, American military and other countries' militaries were out here. Oh. And so their service members are out here spending a lot of money. And of course, there's girls, and boom, that industry blew up. So ever since mm. then... That industry has been really, really big. And mm. of course, it's growing even more because now people can fly all over the world in a few hours to get here, you know? Yep. So Thailand's a great place to come if you're into that kind of stuff because it's yeah, totally it's a, I mean, chill. Bangkok and Phuket are two of the, you know, top, uh, you know, sex tourism capitals of the world. <laughs> like, it is it is what it is. Like, yep. go to, you know, Bangkok and Phuket, you could call it like, uh, you know, the Amsterdam of uh of thailand now weed's legal we can get into that in a sec oh, but um God, that just yeah you, you go to amsterdam so it's the same too. shit you got the Love ladies it. you know half naked dancing in the door you can go in there and you pay you to have sex and it's like brothels yeah. and then in thailand they have their own version of that yeah it's like a massage parlor yeah or, or you can get like you know soapy massage yeah that's very it's popular like a, it's like a whole experience you know dude, new room massage about, new gel <laughs> i was thinking about doing a video about yeah, yeah. uh massages uh, but not even like <laughs> sex related massages different types of just like i have i massages. one of my favorite things about living in thailand is, is getting a massage like i was telling you i, I, I ordered a massage yeah. to our place once or twice a week mm -hmm. like there's so many little little tips 
like oh like the God, yeah. like tell them certain things before how much did you tip what up what if they ask for a happy ending what what about <laughs> it how much should you not pay or overpay um, a lot of that you how just long should you do experience you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah. should i just let people figure it out yeah. right people get ripped off the first time <laughs> don't give them too many tips because then they kind of miss out on the whole like learning yeah, part of it pay you know? two thousand baht yeah oh, just just three thousand <laughs> Yeah, try not to get taken advantage of. Massage like. 300 baht. Uh, <laughs> only 3,000. I mean, that's kind of the idea. Like, you know, if you're going to a touristy place like Patong, know that whoever you're going to run into that's offering you some kind of service is probably going to try to take advantage of you and have you yeah. pay more money than you. Because you don't know the currency yeah. yet. You're just not familiar. Uh, it's happened to all of us. Totally, it happens in Bali all the time. Uh, it's dude, okay. I got ripped off on the taxi cabs. Yeah, oh, of course. Because there's because, like taxi Right when I first there. got there, I did, a, I did a video about this because I was so mad. Like... He goes like, oh, like totally normal. Like, oh yeah, at this price, like I totally didn't know the bills and, you know, paid five, 10 X than what it yeah. could have been. But <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. So be careful with the taxis in Phuket. They're pretty expensive. In Bangkok, it's less like that. It's pretty but normal. You can just actually. use Grab. Yeah. Um, and the Grab app works. Get right. Grab. Obviously. It's great. It's you remember Uber. back in the day when there was no Grab, no Uber, no anything? It was like 2016, 2017. Really? Yeah. Prior to that, there was no ride sharing oh, yeah. apps out here. Yeah. I remember we had to take song towels everywhere. Yeah, the, the song red pickup towels trucks. everywhere in Chiang Mai. <laughs> I think it was similar out here. We Except out here it was just the taxi mafia. It was like only these taxis. And right. they charge a, a ridiculous amounts, you know? Oh. Like $20, $30, $40 just to go like half hour, you know? Yeah, same with Bali. Yeah. 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 So anyways, now it's way easier with the, with the ride-sharing apps. They have more competition, which means lower prices. Yeah. Which is good. So if anything, compare the price of the ride on a ride-sharing app to... Yeah, what they're charging. Yeah, you if you're gonna do yeah, just cash, barter that's them down I based do. on that, you know. Do that all the time. Oh yeah, grab 800 baht. Like how much? Yeah. You want to do 800 baht? Okay, cool. I'll support you, dude. You're sitting there on the. Sometimes street, they like, give them a little bit more money just because they're like they're yeah. already there. Yeah. You can go right now. You and, know, okay, fine. But like, and I'll always tip. Yeah. So. You know, tip on that's tips. Good. That's good. You should do like 10 percent. When I was just uh yeah 10 percent. When I was starting in, in Chiang Mai, you know, bootstrap days, you know, I'll tip 20 baht here and there and there. But yeah. now I tip, you know, 100 baht here and there and there. Yeah. Like, uh, really it's just, you can tip relative to how much you make. That's the more fine. money you make, the more you can tip. Yeah, yeah, you know, like rich people, you know, if you're back and you're multi-gazillionaire yeah. or super rich guy handing out $100 bills to make people's day, like, sure, if, if you want to do that, that's fine. Yeah. Um, you know, so 100, 100 bucks is $3. And so... But yeah, in general, you you can tip you know, fifteen ten percent. So if a massage is is uh, if a massage is is a thousand bucks, that I'm tipping two hundred. Cause like on services in in the U S, it's customary to tip twenty percent. Like saying on, bucks, on, you on mean haircut. bot, right? Two hundred bot. Yeah. Okay. I keep, I keep hearing bucks for some reason. Oh, sorry. I probably said that. I, I always, <laughs> you're I always, talking bot. <laughs> I always misspeak when I yeah. go on rants. I was like, that's a lot for a Two, massage. 200 bot. <laughs> pay a thousand bucks for a massage. Yeah. If, if I pay a thousand dollar, a thousand bot for a massage, <laughs> okay. I'm tipping 200 extra, 20%, which is standard in America for a haircut. It's usually 20%. Yeah. Uh, uh, so if you get a hundred dollar haircut, you're tipping the guy twenty. And you know Thai people are really cool. So it, you know if you tip too low or whatever, they're not going to give you a hard time about it. They're not like stuck up or anything. I've never had any Thai person bother me about like a low tip. Maybe about no tip, but like never like a little bit lower than usual. So you can you can tip somebody whatever you feel comfortable with, and they're just going to be happy to to have it. You know. Yeah. Oh, and one of the biggest things I really don't like about Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> is the the coins um they're so heavy you know and uh -huh. and compared to other coins in other countries oh so if you end up holding a bunch of coins in like a bag or something like that they end up getting so heavy that your bag just gets so weighed oh, down oh yeah man that's why i just and the coins are kind of worth a i lot was gonna too. make like a tip about yeah. coins <laughs> right before you said that so always tip i always just tip my coins tip i'm coins. not gonna yeah, carry exactly. them around you get coins i don't have a wallet yeah. you know i use sticky wallet shout out i'm gonna give you one here yeah yeah um, those are great after and um, so I, I, I was always wondering this. And finally, I asked a, a Thai person and it clarified. So I was like, I always feel weird about like tipping if it's like one bot or like 10 <laughs> bot. Like, it's like, I'm too good for this one bot. Like, is, are they going to be like, no, give no. me a look like. It, and, and she was like, you know yeah. what? For, for some like, you know, an entry level, you know, service person, waitress or, you know, even, you know, whatever motorbike driver, even if it's one bot, like. If they get 30 rides a day and 30 people give them one bot, like that's a whole meal right there. And then I realized like, okay, it's, it, it's totally fine. Like if you have an extra one bot, just give them the one bot. <laughs> 
but sometimes I felt like if I, <laughs> if I only have one bot to tip, should I give it? Is it worth giving it? Or is it like, is it more like, an is insult? it more of like yeah. an insult? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you only get one bot, bro. It depends on the situation. The, the, lowest the context th- matters a lot. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And if like, you only have one bot, then what was the service exactly? But yeah. Um, but, but usually it's like if you get if you get change and it's like paper and coins, usually I just give the coins back and keep the paper. Yeah, that, it, just that's to fine. save the weight and it's not that much money. And it's all relative to how much you And the exchange rate is really good these days by the way. Mhm. I don't know how long that's going to last. It's higher up to uh, Yeah, the US dollar is worth more out here. I, I tend to get like a 5% discount almost on anything because of the exchange rate now. <laughs> mm-hmm. it, it was that way in Indo- it's that way in Indonesia anyways. Mhm. I'm pretty sure it's out here too, but and so let's do a little Thailand versus Bali. So I already gave my little For sure. rant on Phuket as I think it's the hottest thing going next to Bali. Um, what is your, you haven't done time in Phuket. You know what's funny about Phuket? I was just thinking about this earlier. <laughs> the big difference between Phuket and Bali is how big the waves are. Oh, Seriously. someone just told me this. That's why I'm in Bali, dude. It's yeah, the waves. the waves are way bigger, man. Yeah. And they crash hard, and it's just crazy. Like yeah. you can surf anywhere out there. Mm-hmm. Here, though, you just—it's like so calm. It's like a lake almost. It's crazy. It's like kids' waves. Yeah, it's wild. Like the vibes are so calm out here because of that. I feel like mm. the energy is more calm. In Bali, you feel that hectic energy, especially mm. when you're out by the beach. It's because of the waves, man. The ocean mm. is hectic out there. But here, it's like. A big freaking dude. I was lake. just working out in my freaking it's crazy ocean flying. view home gym, and I <laughs> s- I was saw a dude dipping by in a jet ski, and I go, "Oh fuck yeah!" <laughs> out here, it's totally. I want to be that like, guy, yeah. dude. He, it was just lake flat today, and it yeah. still is. It still is like it's totally flat, like a lake. Flat. It's crazy. Yeah, there's no waves anywhere. Yeah, true. It's you you can. There, there's a good amount. That's of dangerous folks. to do in Bali, man. You got to be careful. You yeah. Know? Depending yeah, on the yeah, season. Yeah, there's, yeah. There's, Fucking shredders down there, mate. <laughs> fucking shredders, surf's I, I, up, mate. I've been pretty close to drowning a couple times surfing in Bali because the waves are so heavy, oh, man. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, it's pretty rough you sometimes. You got to be really careful. You got to scare. Well, because, uh, you know, Kuta Beach is basically three different swell directions go into the same place. So when you're there, when the, when the swell is heavy, it can be like, I don't know, three meters, four meters or something like that, you know? Mm. Um, it's heavy enough to where the waves, when they come down, it's just really strong you know so if you get caught in the impact zone like either you're paddling out or you're, or you're trying to get back in or whatever it is you know usually it's because you got wrecked or something you like you get up and then you're in the impact zone it's just like you either Fuck. have to paddle out as fast as you can or paddle in as fast as you can the wave crashes right on you it'll flip you underwater like two three times Fuck. <laughs> you know <laughs> it's that strong it's like a washing machine and then you wind up you're underwater upside down you don't know where the heck you are what's going on and you're running out of breath practically because you know you're stressed out so one of the things about uh uh, about surfing is learning how to hold your breath underwater for a long time and and relax you know it's really important um and just not like not uh panic you know avoid panic as much as possible right 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 and uh, you can take free diving courses out there and stuff um yeah out here too but that's, that's a great idea uh, what i do is i if i swim in the pool i'll just like try to swim from one end to the other without you know coming up to the top that's a good way to practice like because you got to practice holding your breath but also moving at the same time because if mm. you just hold your breath and you sit underwater you're not really simulating a real world experience like when it when you're under a wave it's throwing you around yeah. you're getting thrashed you know so if you if you swim a lot when you're holding your breath you can really learn more like how to hold it and yeah do the it. back and forth underwater yeah so. yeah you, i gotta get it was so yeah that's interesting <laughs> because like in the ice tub i can do like two minutes two and a half sometimes yeah because you're just sitting there, just right? straight holding and, and you do the breathing beforehand like the yeah like 10 deep breaths the heavy breathing yeah exactly you yeah can, the wim hof can, breaths before yeah, wim hof breaths. if you do 20 of those you can go really long i've noticed in, a, in an ice bath you can go even longer. Ah. I've found because it like freezes your brain and maybe like slows your heart. It it turns you into an ice cube. I love it. Going on cool. the the meditations. I call it an ice meditation. You I get in there. So I do like one minute head above and then ten to twenty deep breaths and then plug my nose, get under, and I'm just like for two minutes, two and a half. I'm just like meditating, picturing myself as like Buddha or like Gandhi or something, and I'm just like frozen in like under an ice lake and you can't hear anything and it's just so fucking good and then you come out and you're like i'm alive yeah <laughs> that was actually a, a wim hof gif that Damn. uh I gotta try that that said i'm alive i just sent that to someone and so the ice bath is uh 
It's it, crazy. It's pretty painful, but you, your body adapts. To well, it, it depends quickly, how right? cold you get it. And with the yeah. ice bag method, you can dial in the temperature. Uh, so like, okay. um, like the volume of it. water in the ice. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> Cause Danny, we were talking about, <laughs> yeah. Oh God, we got to pay the ice guy. And I was like, all right, pay it. And I sent this GIF. I'm alive. <laughs> <It went off. laughs> and so it's like, yeah, I see why he says that. Cause you get out of there and that's all you want to say. It's uh -huh. like, I'm hot. It's it's natural drugs. I'm still alive. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling. I was telling Trevor the other thing. It's it's natural fucking cocaine. That's the how adrenaline filled your brain is mm. after that. Mm. It's just all switches on. Mm. And so that's the whole thing behind the Wim Hof craze. Yeah. Is it makes you feel like natural, yeah. natural high, natural drugs for Absolutely. for a period of time. Like I've noticed, like an hour or two, you'll just feel great. Just <laughs> Whew, the best mood ever going to work like you want to sing in the shower you're just like you're just like <laughs> um, on one uh, especially like work out first and then sauna and then ice you know for two minute hold and then sauna and then ice again two minute hold Whew, you are ready for the day don't even need coffee better than coffee mm. 10 times stronger it's amazing what chemicals our brains can produce on their own without the help of drugs mm -hmm. just by doing things like that yep I mean, why do people work out in the morning? Same effect as coffee, right? right. And if you listen to, to Huberman morning. and all these, you know, you know, very smart, you know, biohackers. Yeah, Huberman, man, that guy's got. A ton I of started listening too. to more of that. I mean, He's really it's basically it sums it up. So, adrenaline and dopamine, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so, working out floods your brain with adrenaline and dopamine. <clears throat> That's why we feel awake and energy and turned on. And coffee, caffeine gives you that without having to do anything you just drink this magic thing and it gives you some of that dopamine and adrenaline cool but you can actually get more um if you do an intense workout so that's why i love hill, hill sprints because mm. it's like i call it the lazy man's intense workout there's no complex thing you don't have to lift anything just run as hard as you can up that hill and you're gonna be dead you're falling on the floor and you're complete exhaustion and so that hill is really steep yeah, yeah and <laughs> I so just drove down that thing in a it's bike really it's like, like <laughs> i just took bam up there the other day and he was like oh 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 fucking I mean, dead. that's no joke like and i've been like, on trails that go that steep and that is very difficult no, yeah you you build up to it because i've been i've been you know i mean, I mean since it's high just, school like it's football athletes like hill sprints on saturdays you do 100 meters walk back down six times and that's one of the only times that I puked. Mm. I remember hill sprints <laughs> in high school football. And so what I try to do or when I feel most awake uh, or in the morning, if I have limited time, what's the quickest way I can get to full exhaustion. Mm. And so it's a hill sprint, walk down, do like three, you know, walk, sprint hundred meters and walk down. Or I will go outside to this barbell that we were doing and I will do 10 deadlifts, 10 uh, po power clean thrusters mm. and then 10 rows and then 10 pull-ups and then 10 dips at the end of that you're like oh fully exerted exhaustion pumped <laughs> and then fully pumped up yeah and it's like only 100 reps or whatever fully pumped up wait to pump you up <laughs> get pumped up so it's that or you can another one is we just ordered an assault bike the crossfit bikes like this and I, I did one this morning. If you do one minute as hard as you can, you're falling on the floor afterwards, fully exerted. So that is just one minute and you're fully awake in the morning. And so um, there is my how to wake up the fastest lecture. It's <laughs> a good idea. I mean, working out when you first wake up is the best way to get going. You, yeah. you move the blood flow. Yeah, you just... Everything just feels better because yeah. of that. You're warmer, you know? You can yeah. feel it. Your your brain works better. Yeah. I mean, supplements and all this other stuff and coffee. Yeah. Coffee aside. is good and coffee is great, but um, I switch it up. You know, I, I don't work out first thing in the morning every day. Mm. I Sometimes if, uh, if I'm working on something exciting, I want to hop out of bed and turn on the computer and get back to it. Yeah. You know what I was doing last night and, and I'll do coffee and then I'll work out later in the day. So true. Um, yeah, it just you know. depends what you're feeling that day. Yeah, follow your follow your energy. Right. Follow Some your day, chakras. Sometimes you just need a day off, you know, like to rest and massage or whatever. Yeah. Like you're sore. Yeah, like normally Sunday I don't work. Like, you know. Go travel, adventure, have like outside experiences, going to nature, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's really important too. 
Life's a balance. Yeah, totally. And so what about this question? Um, mm. All right. Um, advice for aspiring digital nomads. Um, maybe that goes back into the, the, the business models thing. What would you do if you're like someone who, I, I, you know, I get this question. Dude, saw your videos, whatever. Like, okay, I'm trying to work remote. Like, what would you recommend I do mm. these, these days? Yeah. Yeah, I like the the phone sales stuff. That's cool. I, I think it just really depends. You have to like look at yourself and figure out what you're good at, <clears throat> what your strengths and weaknesses are, and what opportunities are out there. You know, just do a SWOT analysis on yourself. You know, mm. strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. Like, mm. think about yourself as a business, and then make your SWOT analysis, and then go after that thing that makes the most sense. The the, the, the you know the what is it called the the Venn diagram? You know, like yeah, you're good at this, you're good at that. Okay, let's that's find the called you know? um. Icky guy, like whatever the cross, where the crossroads are, yeah. like where where things intersect. That's what you should definitely do f- with yourself. Not everybody's the same. Some people are more extroverted, so phone sales makes more sense. Some people are more introverted, so dropshipping makes more sense. Um, some people are more techy, so coding makes more sense. And some people are more creative, so freelancing, like writing or graphic design or something like that, makes more sense. Or video editing, whatever. Yeah. Um, some people really like to travel and create videos. So travel blogging makes sense. There's just tons of different things you can do. Um, you just got to figure out what is right for you and then figure out how to do it. Like I would just say, go online and find a mentor. Mm. You know, there's tons of them and just start with YouTube, type in what you're trying to figure out and choose somebody who you'd like to listen to. And usually they'll have a course or something, you know, and just go down that rabbit hole. That's it. Yeah. Icky guy. Icky guy. Oh, I've never even heard of that. It's it's that very great. similar to what you were just saying, but I've never heard of that one. Strengths, weaknesses, oh, yeah, opportunities, threats. Yeah. But icky guy, I yeah. learned it. So it's like similar. What you love. What, you love. what you're good at. What you're good at. What you can get paid for. Yeah. And what the world needs, demand. Where those all intersect mm. in the beginning is the ideal thing. And, and th- it might not always be the same. It's, you know, people change. I think in your early 20s, you might be really good at something, but be like less interested in that thing you're really good at and be actually more interested in something you're not that good at, that kind of thing. You know, I, I went through that a lot in my 20s. And you kind of, your 20s is sort of like your discovery period in your life, like yeah. figuring out what you're good at and what you like and what, you know, what can make money versus what's just kind of like a hobby and just, you know, trying to figure out that. Like for me personally, I'm a skateboarder. I've always been a skateboarder but I've never made money doing it. It's just not something I want to pursue in the business realm. Mm -hmm. I just want to have fun with it. Um, Whereas with business, I've always done really good at understanding retail. So I took that to the internet and now I'm doing e-commerce. It just works for me. Um, Whatever your past experiences are, what you like, what you're good at, that kind of stuff will work for you. So just try to consider that. And if one thing doesn't work out, don't think you're never going to be good at anything. You know, like I, I tried to do a skateboard company when I first started with entrepreneurship and it just didn't work out cause I didn't really know what I was doing and I, mm. I just wasn't confident about it. And so, which is fine. Like just take that and try to learn from it. Like every failure has lessons you can learn and then you, you apply those to the next thing you do and just try to do a better job. And just, if one thing doesn't work out, try a different thing. If that doesn't work out, try a different thing until something works out. Once something works out for you, go all in on that. Yeah. Like a door opens, walk through that door, t- you know, opportunities will show up and you just have to have the absolute hundred percent confidence and like no hesitation to, to go for it. Like, I'm sure like you guys, the, the same thing with the Amazon FBA stuff, because you were doing high ticket before that and it yeah. wasn't really working out. Right. Yeah. You but pivot. yeah, you just, you just pivoted and, yeah. and Amazon worked out and you just kept yeah, doing it. Like, exactly. and here you are. Like, and now, yeah. And now you're pivoting later, even more, you know, we're, Amazon is my career. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah, absolutely. It, it, that's how it is for everybody. So you just got to find what, what that is. Yeah. yeah. It's so funny, like, it's different for 20s is your discovery period. Mm. But the funny thing about the way society is set up, and I'm not saying it's, it's, <clears throat> it's bad, is you're supposed to pick your career at, at 18 in college. Oh, yeah. But it's never... It's too early. It's, it's, too, it's too early to pick because you, you haven't tested out if you like that career slash lifestyle. Yeah, absolutely. And so your 20s should be trying, I mean, and Gary Vee. A and lot like, of all traveling. The, all, all, all these entrepreneurs... 20 should be, as Gary Vee says, start that fucking business, <laughs> travel, live in a different country. Yeah. You can work remotely nowadays. 
Start the fucking YouTube channel. Start the fucking TikTok. Yep. Start the fucking dropshipping business. Start your little brands. Do your music shit and try <laughs> everything. Go, go to Africa. Date some African girls, okay? <laughs> See what you like. Go, you know, date girls from all around the world and try things. And you can, you know, the cool thing with nowadays is you can work while you travel at the same time. They don't need to be mutually exclusive. Yeah. And then your first shit's going to fail. Same with your f second shit and probably your third shit. And then you're going to figure out, okay, I got this. Okay, I got some traction with this shit. Boom, and this is actually dope. Boom, let's keep, let's keep it rolling and rocking. And then, you know, um, at, at some point you can uh, start to outsource build a team and then you can have more free time to start doing your passion businesses so for me it's this podcast and uh and traveling and um so yeah that's your 20s but that should be all of your 20s and even your 30s too gary yeah. v says all the time like oh, yeah. dude you're 30 fucking three you're fucking a kid the, the 30s are your new 20 are the new 20s 100 percent. <laughs> inside like that's i tell so everyone like yeah i turned 33 but like honest like i'm, I'm living i might as well be 23 mm. just pretend i'm 23 and then you'll understand like what I'm doing in my mindset. Well, I'm still so trying learn, everything. I'm still want to go keep, keep traveling, not thinking about settling down or, or starting a family or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe in forties. Okay. Forties, <laughs> the new 30. Okay. Then, you know, many, many people get married and do family in the, in the forties thing. And, and 50s, there's plenty, of, there's plenty of people who have already done everything yeah. and you can see anything you're trying to do. It's already been done on YouTube. Someone's already talking about on YouTube who has more experience than you. You can learn from that. But then that's the 20s. And then the 30s, you can optimize and dial it in. And the cool thing about the 30s is you can... The cool thing about 30s is the new 20 is do your 20s over again, but with more money, mm. with more connections, mm. with more wisdom, mm, with more maturity, experience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the girls actually like you more because yeah, of all those things. Absolutely, more money usually. <laughs> more friends, more connections. Uh, and you can just do your 20s over again, but better and not broke. Uh, absolutely. And you know more about yourself too. You know, and that's huge because you got to know yourself and it takes time to learn like what you like, what you're good at, you know, all that stuff. Once you, once you go through experiences, you travel and you meet different people, you just learn more about the types of people you like to hang out with, the types of situations you like to be around. Maybe in your early 20s, partying is awesome. But dude, by your 30s, you're usually not partying as often, mm -hmm. like all the time. And like you'll go out on the weekend or something like that, but you're working, man. You're hustling, you know, yeah. because you know that you hustle now, you get paid later. You party now you don't get paid later for that shit, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just, I, well, Hey, sometimes you do. If you, if yeah. you're, if you're out partying and you're networking, you know what I mean? Then you mm. make connections in, or mm. you're always thinking about that. Then yeah, that will result in good things too. That so. brings up a big point. Cause I've partied more this last year than, than any <laughs> year I've, I've always, of course a lot, but it's just kind of to the next level. You know, we're yeah. always the VVIP, you know, quote unquote, whatever, but, and literally if there is, and, um, it's kind of like you build your click, build your entourage yeah. and networking is a huge thing because it's, it's been this point in this last year where it's like, you know, so many friends. And then every time you go out, you meet all those friends, friends. And it's like a runaway effect with how many friends you have. It's a, uh, it's, it's awesome. Um, and so that was the point that I, that I um, missed out on saying with the podcast with Matt is, um, you know, partying can, you know, going to, we can call partying just events and you can call it networking events. And mm -hmm. I have some friends that like, they don't do stuff. They don't get fucked up. But they go there and they're like, they're on their game networking. Cause like, you know, some of these big events, like rich motherfucking business, like high people are there in Phuket and they're just networking and they're just like meeting people. Mm -hmm. And so for, for that, like quote unquote partying or networking, that's a huge part of it. Um, so there's that. And then there's also... Um, you know, in the same flavor of networking, there's um, business development, um, especially if you are living and going out to events with your business partners. So for example, like my best friends are also my business partners. Sometimes when you're getting fucked up at parties, some of the best, some important things may come out or so we have some of the best brainstorm ideas totally. when you're out. Yeah, and ideas so, just pop out. And so that's times. invaluable. And totally. it's, so it's good for quote unquote uh, bonding with your friends and bonding with your business partners too. 
um, going out to events and maybe, you know, doing some substances and, and getting <laughs> fucked up is, yeah. that's another valuable part of it. Yeah. You're opening up doors in your mind and yeah. you know, ideas flow that way. Yeah. Energy flows. Let me make sure, let me change this battery. Sweet. And we're back after another quick break and, um, we back. Yeah, what was your summary of Bali versus Thailand? <laughs> <laughs> same, same, but different. <laughs> yeah. S- same, same, but different, you know? Yeah. And then, do you know what's a f- fascinating thing that, like, low-key blew my mind when I realized it? Okay, so accents. Like, mm. we can all tell the difference between a British accent and an American accent. Yeah. At the very minimum. And Australian, for sure. And Australian, you know? Yeah. And if you get advanced, you know. Or New Zealand. I like me, I know the difference between, all, even in the European countries... You know, French, Italian, German, like Dutch. I know we can tell all these things. Some folks in um, Asia or or other countries do not pick up the difference between a British accent and an American accent or or or, or Australian. They have no idea. Oh yeah, yeah. And right. like, and I'm I've done this multiple times, test, and I go because they'll be like, someone will say, "Oh, where are you from?" And I go, "Oh, can you tell by my voice?" Yeah. Um, British, yeah. um, Australian. I'm like, really? Do I sound British? Like, oh, what do you mean? Like, they have, they have no, idea, they can't comprehend it. Yeah. And then I was like, mind blown. Like, really? You can't tell? like. He's Australian. And he sounds like this. He's British, but it's normal for us. And then I realized, you know what? Can I comprehend the difference between? And even like a Southern uh, American accent, we can totally tell. Oh yeah. But could I tell the difference like between New Jersey accent? There's yeah. also a Northern Thai accent and a Southern. Yeah, I can't tell. I don't know. Could I, could I tell the difference between that? No. no of course and not. so I was like, oh, maybe that's the same thing with like Definitely. some Asian can't tell the difference between British and, and American and Australian accent. It's like um, American just accent like, is confusing because you got California, you got New Jersey, you got Southern, yeah. like you said. But, um, it's definitely different, different places. Yeah. Yeah. But same with Thailand, they have different accents and I would have no idea. Yeah. You know, I, we, if you, 100%. now then again, I don't understand the language. They understand English, but that was just an interesting fact. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I was blown away yeah. by, but like how in some people's, it doesn't even register because you're just trying to think about the Chinese words. Chinese has some crazy amount of dialects, man. Like how many? Oh, really? Yeah. Um, you know, there's different ways of speaking Chinese, Mandarin and, and what's the uh-huh. other one? Um, Cantonese? Yeah, what they speak in Hong Kong. Yeah, I love I love accents. Yeah, baby, yeah. <laughs> it's because like, I grew up like young kid watching Austin Powers. Do I make you horny, baby? Do I? Yeah. Okay. Seven major modern Chinese dialect groups. Oh. Mandarin, Wu, Zhang, Gan, Keisha, Min, and Yue. Yi, wu, shang, shu, wu. Still, like, <laughs> you know, seven different ways yeah, to, to speak Chinese, you know. Yeah. And, of course, I would never know the difference unless I actually lived out there and spoke the language. Yeah. And so That's a good point, though. I, I always get a kick of when... Um, People ask me if I'm Australian Some all the time. random Thai and girl, I think yeah. the only reason is because I have tattoos. And Australian exactly. people have a lot that's of why, tattoos. Exactly. That's why I'm, <laughs> always, I always <laughs> laugh when someone's like, oh, where are you from? I'm like, um, I don't know. Can you guess where I'm from? And like, uh, you look like uh, Finland. Uh, you look like uh, England. I'm like, yeah, well, like, yeah. well, and I tell people, like, yeah. if you want to, like, you have to listen to the accents. Like, you, you can't white people or white people and it's just so like it's 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 cute i guess it's it's cute um <laughs> but yeah. like to, I, like to me it was like oh seeing a totally different perspective about um how if you want to know how someone's from it's well especially a white person <laughs> there were white people are all from europe so you gotta listen to the accent to know what country they're from True. Anyway, let's get back into okay, list of questions <laughs> and we'll do grand finale and then Marcus should be showing up in like thirty minutes, so we got plenty of time. Oh perfect. Um biggest struggles as a digital nomad. Oh my god, yeah. As an expat. It's just adapting to different cultures, you know? Because oh. a digital nomad you're gonna usually be traveling places that are way different from your hometown. Mm. You know, Asia is just completely different. Everything's different. I try it. People ask me that have never really traveled before. And I'm like, oh, a good way to start is just completely different. You know, like they, they drive on the left side of the road. Um, traffic laws aren't as strict. There's not nearly as many police everywhere. Like mm. in Bali, you can drive on the sidewalks if you have a motorbike, you know, mm. just to get around bad traffic. Police don't care. 
Um, obviously there's the language that's, that are different. The money is different. Um, things cost a lot less, which is great, but at the same time you can get ripped off too, if you're not careful. So you have to be careful. Um, but yeah, for struggles, I mean, it's just kind of like learning the hard way, what is good and what's not good out here, you know, good places to go, not good places to go. Uh, but the easiest way to get around that is just watch plenty of YouTube videos and have friends to go places with that already know. That's basically the hack. <laughs> Exactly. And so digital nomad, there's like, there's two things we're talking about. All right. So he was talking about living abroad struggles. The other thing <laughs> is funny. entrepreneur slash working for yourself slash solopreneur hmm. slash working remotely, not in an office with company. And so there's two sides, right? Digital nomads like, well, what are you sure. talking about? What aspect are you talking about? You got to get used to that. Like cafe Wi-Fi, sometimes they suck. Yeah. You know, so so you said Starbucks you said the that, living like, abroad part, yeah. which was great. Now we can move into second category. Well, because like uh, I just want to preface this. Like my experience is mostly from starting as a digital nomad and then becoming an expat. Like I don't yeah. even go back to the U.S. more than like once a year now. And that's for tax reasons, but also just because I generally like living out here more, you yeah. know, like I visit my family, but usually just like once a year, you know, it's enough. It's cool. Yeah, same. Yeah. Um, it just depends on like you and where you're from and like whether you have a lot of family and friends, you want to go back to the U S all the time. Um, just to speak on that note a little bit longer, um, as far as avoiding taxes goes, cause I think that's like a really important thing. If you're going to become a digital nomad and actually stay abroad for a long period of time, I think it's really important that you look at your, the state that you're a resident in <clears throat> and how much tax they charge you on your income because the IRS, you know, they'll charge you tax on your income, no matter where in the world you live. Yeah. You're paying that social security, Medicare at the minimum 15%. Uh, but if you, if your residence is in California, you're going to pay an extra 10%, no matter where you earn that income. So it makes a lot more sense to move to a state that has zero income tax, you know? And then if you're going to be out of the country for a long time, you can take advantage of the federal earned income exclusion, which is up to a hundred thousand dollars of revenue tax free for federal foreign you know? earned income yeah. exemption. Yeah. F F E I E. <clears throat> Just ask your, like your accountant or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've, I've taken, I've implemented that. that. Yep. And it'll save you some money. Uh, but I moved to South Dakota. Moved? What does that mean? Yeah, like I'm a Just South Dakota resident. Can you, can you do that online? Practically, yeah. But you have to go there in person. But okay. they're the easiest state to move to. It's like it's like an old nomad hack. People, like especially retirees, they retire, they sell their house, they just have an RV, and they want to drive around all the time. It's very popular to move to South Dakota because all you have to do is set up a virtual office with the, with the one company that's in town. <laughs> which is, you know, a couple hundred bucks a year or something like that, 20 bucks a month. And then you go and get a hotel room or even a campsite for a minimum of one night. And then you go to the DMV with your hotel invoice receipt, your virtual mailbox and the form, and you become a resident. You get a driver's license. You <laughs> register to vote, and now you don't pay any taxes. Mm. State, There's because no they state don't tax. charge any state income tax. Mm. Yeah. What's the income tax in Washington? Washington State? Income tax is like 5%. Okay. Or am I tripping? Yeah, whoa. Yeah, South Dakota. Okay. And no, then, no, um, Washington State has no income tax. Sorry. Yeah, no income tax. Um, but you have to keep in mind, Washington State has a thing for businesses where they charge 1% gross income tax on mm. a business that's registered in that state. So um, I used to live in Washington and have my business registered in Wyoming, yeah. which was fine. But the problem is, is if anybody ever found that out, that like works for the state, they could probably figure out a way legally to force you to pay like back taxes, you know, 1% oh. of all your gross income. So, um, that's why I wanted to move to South Dakota is because they don't have that. And you register your business in South Dakota? No, also? you still register in Wyoming, but they don't okay. have a rule where if businesses that are registered have like a gross income okay, tax, they cool. don't have anything like that. So my business or one of them is registered in Wyoming as well. Yeah. Can you tell people what's the point of that? Well, yeah, it's the same thing as the South Dakota thing is no income tax. You know, it's really easy to register, um, great privacy laws, super cheap registration, you know, it's just easy and fast, you know? Yeah. And, and so. minimal, uh, um, reporting requirements. Yeah, exactly. It, That's the thing about like awesome. what business to register in Washington. It's like every month you got to like re submit like some report or something. Yeah. It's a lot. It's, it's like too much. And they want to charge you tons of tax. It's like, yeah, they want me to do more reporting and pay you more tax. Just have the, be you know, benefit of being in Washington to do business. Doesn't make any sense. 
doesn't make any sense at all, actually. Because you're, if you're <laughs> e-commerce, you don't have to do it. It's, it's for businesses that are physically located there. Mm. You know? why? I mean, yeah. Like, yeah, why agree. Amazon puts their headquarters there, yeah. I don't understand. I mean, but. my business is... Where is it? Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> with you, you know, wherever you happen to be. And it's in there. Exactly. It's in there. It could it's be in anywhere. a screen. It's it in the metaverse. In country. It's, it's wherever you put your VPN connection any particular yeah, it's day. Yeah, it's in an alternate <laughs> universe. It's uh, in, so it's like, yeah, for tax reasons, you got to decide, especially if you have like a software company or if you just deliver services or maybe you like just do YouTube or something you entertain for a living. Um, you don't even have to have your business in America. You could have it based in a, in a tax-free place like Dubai. Dubai... You get a um, mm. set up an LLC in Dubai or whatever, and it's like no tax at all. I have friends that are doing it. Like if you're mm. a coder, if you're a freelancer, that kind of thing, and you and you work for companies abroad or whatever, you can you can establish yourself in a country, in a place like Dubai and take advantage of that. Um, I, of course, for me, I can't do that because my business high, high ticket dropshipping is based on suppliers that are in the U.S. So I have to have a U.S. based business, mm. and plus I want to take advantage of the credit cards anyways. Um, but yeah, the the way you do that with US is you can have a dual citizenship. So you just you set up the business over there, you get the dual citizenship, and then you can fly in and out of that country all the time whenever you want to. Dubai. Yeah. So for really rich people or people that have like a really big business that's software based or something like that, you usually use like Dubai, Hong Kong, Singapore, yeah. um, or like there's the really big businesses use like a combination of like Ireland and uh, you know uh, Caribbean, small Caribbean based yeah, countries, yeah, you know, Cayman that offer, Islands. yeah. Cayman islands, that yeah, kind of stuff. Exactly. Gonna get, yeah. There's a really good book. I was reading a little bit on it. Um, uh, it's called like rich dad guide to tax something. I forget, but mm-hmm. they explain how Apple avoids paying like billions of dollars on oh, yeah. taxes, you know, <laughs> all, all these big corporations, they got offshore. Accounts but you can, there. you can do a similar thing on a smaller scale as a digital nomad. Yeah. And that's why I love like, um, people that are like, uh, about the credit card thing. Oh, but you're, you're gaming the system. I go, okay. If we're going to talk about gaming the system, <laughs> think about the iPhone that you're holding in your hand. They have so many offshore accounts in the Cayman Islands and Panama, whatever, to avoid. Amazon that you shop pays basically zero tax. Why should I pay 20000 yeah, in tax? Yeah. Amazon makes a trillion dollars and they pay nothing. You're supposed to game the system. Yeah, absolutely. It's the least we can do. Yeah. Rant done. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention your favorite politicians that you're voting for. They are doing deals all the time to help these companies avoid taxes and to siphon off money. They're just playing the game. It's not illegal, but they're just playing the game. Mm. That's the system that we live in. We live in this money game system. That's it's right. all a board game. If you're not doing the, 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 the business class taxes or business class free flights on these sign up credit card bonuses, then uh, you're, that's right there on the table. Just play the game. It's not illegal. And not only that, they even will use insider information to trade stocks and options based on what they know as politicians that these companies are lobbying them to do, yeah. which is really crazy. Yeah. And it's not illegal. Yeah. What? It's just a game. What? Yeah. Right. Dude, it talk about hacking life, man. Wait, insider trading is not illegal in, in where? In, in the illegal. Senate, like in the, in the Congress. Oh. These people can buy and sell shares of companies oh. even if they're what like, even if they know something already and they, and they oh. never get tracked down. Like, like just, you can look up uh, Nancy Pelosi's like stock trades <laughs> on the internet <laughs> yeah. and, and the number of times she's been like 100% right is like crazy. Uh, there only been a few times where she wasn't right. Most of it is right. And it's because she knows ahead of time, like, yeah. okay, the U.S. is doing, like, a, a, the CHIPS Act came out, and so she, like, sold all of her NVIDIA stock or something like that, and then it tanked, like, the next week or something like that. Yeah. Just little things like that. We're like, what? Seriously? Yeah. So there, there's so, even websites that make trackers that track the Congress people's trades so that yeah. you can trade them yourself. It's kind of funny. Yeah, so credit card bonus um, hacking is the least we can do. Yeah, that's a good start. Yeah. And if you, if you really want to get into crazy rabbit holes of uh, hack, hack, uh, rigged games that you can try to hack, it, you can look at the stock market and the crypto world. But mm. I, I feel like that's a whole other uh, podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Topic. Um, it goes deep, man. <laughs> here's one I can make a, um, a little clip out of. So some people ask, is it illegal to work remotely in Thailand? That's a good question. It's kind of a gray area. Yeah, and so I have the article here, and I looked this up, 
And this explains it better than I've ever explained. Can digital nomads work in Thailand without a work permit? And the answer is basically exactly. It depends what you're doing. Yeah. It's totally okay as long as you're not conducting any business in Thailand locally, yeah. such as doing Amazon, e-commerce, most things. When it gets into the gray area is let's say you're doing a YouTube channel that focuses on living in Thailand. That is your YouTube channel mm. or YouTube channel about reviewing Thai restaurants. Mm. And that's the focus of your channel. And this article, you can check it link below, mm. describes it. And it's like, if your business is focused on the Thai market, something about Thailand, and that's the focus of your channel, then yes, you would need a work permit. And so it's kind of a gray area, but what about me? Um, I don't just talk about Thailand stuff, but I do a good amount. Um, I, don't, I don't think you would fall into that. Your channel is not Thailand living that life. Yeah, you know right. what I mean? So yeah. yeah, I think you'd be fine. Exactly. But if it were, if, like, it, if it was like Thai, like the guy that does uh, Thailand working for you or whatever, what's his name? Oh, Canadian remote guy. working for you? Yeah. Or, no, yeah. Retired, retired working for you. Working for you. Yeah, that guy. Great channel. But I'm sure he probably falls into that category. I mean, he talks about Thailand almost every video. I mean, actually, uh, technically it's, not because it's not Thailand something. Right. It's gray area. It's gray area. Yeah. What about, he does Korean videos. He does videos of other stuff. So yeah, I guess he like, could probably avoid what about, that. Oh, I just went to Japan and did a video. Like it, it's so, yeah, yeah. but anyways, that was the way this, um, blog writer described it. <laughs> you know, what's funny though doing... is Thailand. Like, okay, what's the whole point of this? It's to avoid paying their taxes or whatever their visa fees, right? Which are basically taxes. Mm. And it's like, at the end of the day, it's Southeast Asia. You can pay to get out of any situation. Mm. It just costs a little bit of money. So yeah. like if they really want to come after you, okay, okay. How much do you really want? You know, yeah. and just slide them some money okay, on the table. Yeah. Let me know. Yeah. 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 Exactly. You can either just... Or just buy one of their expensive visas, you know, like, yeah, get the elite That's visa. That's all they want. It's just a money grab for yeah, them, it's, man. Yeah, it's all, it's all money. It's just, and the reason they have you know, these laws is to, yeah, just, to make money and have it be, you know, fair. Just whatever. be careful, like, what you're doing and don't be too, like, uh, flamboyant about your work. Like, okay, don't, don't do, like, a live webinar in a cafe, you know, in, like, the middle of Bangkok or something. Like, that's so silly, you know? Well, like, I mean, that's, that's fine, but as long as you're not conducting business in Thailand. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. Well, anyway, what I'm trying to get at is, like, just be respectful. Yeah, right. That's all. Like Thai, Thai people are all about like respect and like, you know. Uh, right. In Thai, you wouldn't see, uh, but I mean, in cafes, even before COVID, but now COVID has accelerated it. You walk into coffee shops. I mean, we've all seen this in every country. Starbucks, it's packed and everyone's there working yeah, <laughs> on a laptop. That's what I love about Thailand, man. Just Especially Bangkok. Loud, it's just, it, it, tons of students too. And like digital nomads from everywhere and different careers and stuff. You see what they're doing. They're like somebody's coding, somebody's writing, you know, somebody's students. Researching. Oh man. You see those highlighter pens out there <laughs> and they are just, and they're there like all hours of the night too. <laughs> like three in the morning, you'll go to the cafe. There's students there, you know, working yeah. on learning. So. The, and that always gives me a kick. Like, it's great. I think, man, if I had the, work ethic as a student that I did as an entrepreneur, man, I make so much more money. Right. Like students are the hardest workers and they get paid nothing. They pay to work. Yeah. <laughs> they get paid to I stay mean, up start and, somewhere, and, you know. and take this, you know, of course I'm, you know, I'm clowning and obviously it, it is what it is, but if you, if your goal is to be an entrepreneur and digital nomad, of course, you it, don't, it is you don't kind of funny though, how people put like everything into getting an A, whereas like, Later on, their their job or whatever, they're just like, oh, whatever, I don't know, I can't yeah. do anything. It's like, dude, if you just put the same energy into being uh, a business owner, entrepreneur, as you did dude, trying yeah. to get an A on that report, like <laughs> that's the thing. But <laughs> you know, it's like you'd go so far because in to get an A, a or to, 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 to at least to pass the test, we're like, it's forced, or else you're socially shamed. Yeah, you it, have to re take the all test, it is. and there's it's a like big social, fee. There's a uh, big, big, big fee. Like right. there's a fit, there's a money fee. You have to pay for the course oh, again. Probably stuff. your parents have to pay for it. And there's a social um, punishment because it's like kind of embarrassing. Oh yeah, mm. I'm doing this course again. You got to show up again. And it's mm. like, ugh. but with business, okay. Running your own business, there's not that immediate punishment. There's no, these deadlines yeah. and that's, we're going on the whole, you know, entrepreneur, you know, life thing, yeah. but at least, you know, cause when you have a job, at least, you know, you don't get the project done and you get fired, you know, there's a punishment, yeah. but that's in terms of entrepreneur struggles. Um, I was talking about this in the, in the discord. Yeah. You're in the discord. Yeah, of mm -hmm. course. Um, is uh, digital nomad discord. 
that uh, that I've been building S- super awesome is um, yeah, basically prioritizing and organizing. And because when you work for yourself, there's no set deadlines. So it's like, oh, I can, that can push back to next week. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I'm, I'm free for any distraction to take me down. Because there's no set deadlines and there's no boss telling you what to do, what to do. You're not an employee or worker. You're, yeah. as, a, as a company owner, it's like there's this whole rainbow smorgasbord of things in the company. Yeah. What should I do today? You're the CEO. And so this, highly yeah. recommend that we filmed it at the beginning of vlog, but this um this four quadrant by um by the book seven habits of highly effective people you organize the top left is most urgent and important down to the top uh, down to the bottom right mm-hmm. it kind of organizes your priorities and i just did that yesterday shout out to brendan for showing me that from uh fruiting body podcast because that's but um wh- what i'm trying to do as you saw maybe in the discord is um so companies, remote companies do like daily standups or weekly standups and they'll do it in Slack. What you did yesterday, what you're doing today, anything holding you back. And so com- some remote companies do that uh, daily, some weekly. So I was thinking about, let's do that in the Discord for anyone that wants to. Mm. Most of us are solopreneurs. Yeah. I'm thinking about doing, you know, Monday, Monday stand up or fucking Monday Monday shout out or whatever the fuck I'm gonna come up with a cooler name for it. I would like that personally. Here's what I did last week because some some days I'm like, what did I even do last week? <laughs> did I even get any important shit done? Right. Here's what I did last week. Here's my five priorities for this week or one priority for for this week. And here's here's the things holding me back that I need to accomplish my goals. And another video I just saw, he's, these company executives, they, they meet every day and they say, here are my top five, five priorities for my department. And so my department and my company is lead generation, so outbound market. Here are my top five priorities, number one. All right, number one is get a new VSL. Number two is get this $97 checklist made. Number three. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway. Sometimes I'm, you got to do that. Now. Just like force yourself to do it, man. Yeah. Cause I get there's, that, there's no, there's no one to keep me there's accountable no one, yeah. as the CEO, as that's the owner. Right. Uh. And so that's why accountability groups. Um, I want to fucking, yeah, let's do one in the discord. Let's do, do it. it man. Let's do it. If you, you want to get it done, it's like, you got to put yourself in an uncomfortable place. Yeah. sometimes I would get out of the house if I wanted to get something done just because it's too comfortable being at home Ooh, for me anyways yeah. like you go me to the too. cafe all of a sudden you're surrounded by people working and like you're just like yeah I want to work too dude you know? I'm like, so productive that's why I'm a Starbucks guy you know me <laughs> Starbucks the is the world's best co-working uh, exactly <laughs> I call it the world's biggest co-working <laughs> company <laughs> I, I love Starbucks man yeah. I'm, it's just got a good vibe it's actually vibe. really cool you know and it, it makes you kind of feel social a little bit too because you're like people are coming in and out all the time yeah. you know and so you can kind of see people listen to stuff whatever put your headphones yeah, on whatever, you can go talk to some girls too you know if yeah. you see something in there something and, but the key <laughs> is like you're so much more focused for some reason and i feel like it's because you're in your brain you're starting to associate the people you see around you as the people keeping you accountable and this is subconscious yes but like why do we feel so much more like yeah. in tune with our work and focus on it yeah. when we're in that space as opposed to home it's because there's people watching us yeah because at, at right. home you can easily go to a distraction yeah. and at Starbucks, there's not going to be that like at home. Um, there's that same social thing that happened in school at the co-work at Starbucks mm-hmm. where, where the people around you are seeing you. So if you're going to be on your phone, you kind of feel stupid or, or yeah. bad, you know, like I shouldn't be like browsing my yeah. phone. I should be working right now. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. And Starbucks, you're not going to like, it's funny, like get that. up and like go get a snack. Uh, well, I mean, you can, but you're just going to get up from your chair less. Cause yeah. if you're not going to be in Starbucks getting up from your chair every 10 minutes. You don't go to Starbucks to like chill and do nothing. I mean, I do sometimes, but, but when you're right, going there to work, right. you're going there to hustle yeah. and then three hours you're gone, you know, usually dude, I do, I do six to sometimes seven hours. More, yeah. <laughs> you see <laughs> me depends. on my story. I do six to seven hours. I'm like, sure, all right, that was a seven hour Starbucks session. And like once a week. <laughs> Um, normally like in, in Bangkok or even in, in Patong, there's like three Starbucks's. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. And you mix it up like different I, ones. I, I mix it up different weekly. Oh. Yeah, oh yeah. Of course, different Starbucks's. And that's yeah. the thing about Starbucks is there's always one and in Bangkok, 
you run into them. It's every fucking block. Yeah. It's uh, and they got great Wi-Fi, man. Like you just sometimes yeah, the cafe, the small cafes don't have good Wi-Fi, yeah. or they're hard to connect or whatever it is. You know, they're just not as reliable. Starbucks always is very reliable. Almost yeah. any country Starbucks you've been to. Yeah, and they they took Wi-Fi. over China. Oh man, I lived in <laughs> Guangzhou for a month. Every fucking block there too. Wow, they yeah. took over Bangkok, you know, slash Thailand. Mm-hmm. Everywhere in Thailand. Um, world's biggest coffee company of, in history, of course, and I would say world's biggest. Thailand's co-working. got a lot of other cafe companies that I think, like the, the True Cafe, it's owned by the same mobile company that does True. Yeah. Uh, uh, mobile. They, they got a bunch of those. It seems yeah. like too, where they're like. Yeah, there's there's plenty of plenty fast. Other ones. It's kind of like a place to market the fast Wi-Fi and, and fast data. And they attract the same crowd. In, in the U.S., you see that happening with the banks. Like there's a Capital One Cafe and stuff like that. Like they try to get people to come in and co-work, remote work or whatever, and then yeah, they'll like do banking. With them. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a it's funny. Th- coffee shops and remote work co-workings are blending, and so True Cafe did that. Yeah. And then there's there's the AIS ones in Bangkok. Right. It's the other you know 5G provider. Right. They have these like cafe. Is it a cafe? Is it a co-working? What is it? It's not a library. Um, <laughs> you you get coffee and you you get a drink. Oh, and there's the what's the one in Chiang Mai? It's it's the AIS camp. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, at the mall there. It, that's yeah. exactly what. That's the yeah, best example. Is it is literally one. a cafe. Is it a co-working space? I don't know. There's no monthly membership. You just have to get a drink. Yeah, exactly. to use the Wi-Fi. No, it's just like a Starbucks. Simple as that. But really good Wi-Fi, and that's the key. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out Super Wi-Fi. Yeah. And Actually, if you, Thailand if you don't really know, good. in Thailand, it's it's really a Super Wi-Fi. It's 100 megabits up and down. Yeah. AIS yeah. is great. True is great. DTAC is fine. And the four the 4G is also 30. 40 megabits up and down. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's blazing out here, boys. It's fiber. And it's affordable too. And they, so. they have 5G out here too. Word. Think, ding, ding. <sighs> That's something dying. Because Anyways, so that was good. Any, um, that was good. That was a t- good, solid two hour dude, pod, yeah. dude. <laughs> we talked about a lot of stuff. <laughs> Loving it. We got packages arriving, man. That's we got a door full of packages. It's almost five right now too. So your yeah. Your friend should be getting here. We can just wrap it up, I guess. Probably. Someone's playing music out yeah. there. But uh, yeah, let's wrap it up. Um, cheers, final yeah, what's cheers. The, what's the next uh, level up where we headed? Um, this? Yeah, no, you're doing your big things. The I'm next level up is. Um, is there another I'm, level up? Or are we chilling? And, <laughs> I'm hustling in, in agency life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, in terms of lifestyle, I mean, I'm living my fucking dream, right? man. I, I, mean, I got nothing do you go to from complain. Here, though? I got nothing. Are we, to are we getting about. private jets and helicopters after this? That's what like, I was telling you. We, like, where's the next level? The man? bad thing about this villa is it's going to be hard to beat. <laughs> are, we, so are we getting sp- nice cars? We're like spoiled. Teslas and Ferraris and shit. I mean, that's a little. But bit no, I mean, right? that's the that's the fun thing about the entrepreneur game is there's no limit to how much you make, and that's why it's exciting to build something like. Absolutely. Especially in the digital game, your business can double in a short period of time. That's yeah. why I'm able to live here is because my agency doubled last year. Yeah. You know, and so I'm trying to double it again, and so. Whether it's e-commerce services, courses, um, you know, I, I got my services. I really, I've been trying to make 10k a month on a course for seven years. <laughs> oh, yeah. I still want to, and you know, if you find that one fucking ad for it's in my new thing, I mean, it's Amazon low ticket course, Amazon checklist, mm. and start the ClickFunnels upsell to the ninety-seven dollar, you know, course mm. up until hey, you want it done for you. Our agency has a done for you Amazon management and and, um, and that too, Dope. mixed with your own physical products. Mm. And so that's yeah. next. I mean, who knows? Where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, I mean, or ten years. I could be making. <laughs> I could be making. Um, Where do you want to? You know, <laughs> multiple, multiple hundred thousands a year, maybe a million a year. Hell yeah. M- maybe multiple millions Ooh, a year. Shit. That's the thing about digital business, bro. It's like <laughs> there's no. There's no fucking top. How much are you willing to hustle to get there? <laughs> well, here's the thing. How hard are you willing to work? Hustle, <laughs> what's the definition of it? Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, and so most people might say, oh, that's hours you put in. Huh. And so, I mean, I, I work normally six to eight hours a day like a normal person, but we're all living the four-hour work week lifestyle. And what right. does that mean? That means living a great, awesome life while you're building your company. You know, Tim Ferriss, he wrote the book about building his multi, multi million dollar supplement company, managing it, running it while traveling the world, while being doing time in Japan, learning, um, you know, learning um, karate or that's that's the Mm. yeah, 
uh, you know, karate, going, living in Argentina, learning salsa dancing while traveling the world and doing interesting shit and meeting interesting people. And so you can live an interesting life and travel while you're building your companies. You can go have fun on the weekends while you're building your companies. And during the weekdays, you are focused on business and on during the weekends, you know, I wake up on the weekends. If you want to call me a weekend warrior, that's fucking great. I wake up on the weekends. What? Oh shit. I'm in Thailand. Oh, I'm in Phuket. One of the top destinations in the world. I wake up every weekend. I'm on vacation in Thailand. Oh shit. I go back to sleep on Monday. Okay. I don't care. Like, I don't care where I am, but you know, we were, <laughs> that's what's so fun about being out here. You wake up and about in the weekend, whatever we're fin we're focused on business Monday through through Thursday. But on the weekends, that's good, man. You wake up and, dude, there's it's that. so fun. It's so fun out here. You, you know, we're in, we're living in some of the biggest vacation destinations in the world, whether it be that Bali or Phuket. Mm -hmm. You know, we, yeah. we live in when we're living in Bali. Like <laughs> it's so easy to get we distracted. wake up on the weekend. <laughs> oh shit, I'm in Bali. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, there's so yeah. many things I could do, like motorbike trips, like volcano hiking, surfing, clubs, cafes, yeah. beach walks, and it's like. No wonder it's a freaking paradise here in Phuket and same with, with Bali and that's it. You know, you don't have to sacrifice one for the other. And so to answer the question, I'm going to just keep working like I do. You know, of course, we always want to work on efficiency. Mm. So, you know, for work week talks about work smart, not hard. Yeah. You know, just tweaking the direction of your company can be way more effective than working more hours. And yeah. so it's working smart. I'm excited about this board to improve my productivity. Yeah. But um, that's it. And that's the thing about digital, this digital business, you, you can, you know, your one thing can blow up and, you know, and to be a million. Well, you were business. talking about like doing the course on top of the service. I think that's really interesting because, you know, that's exactly what you're talking about where it's, it's not just working hard to get more leads to get sell more services. It's also creating another product that those people that don't become clients or even the people that do, both people can consume them. One yeah. person's going to pay for them that wouldn't have paid for you normally. So now you have a whole separate stream of income that's yeah. passive. Yeah. And that can really, really establish like a whole different side of your business Yeah. where you're not always struggling to sell the services and, and, yeah. and, and um, deliver them, but you're yeah. also just creating passive income constantly through whatever method you drive yeah. traffic, but selling courses instead. Yeah. And so, yeah, this agency guy, he was like, you know what? Like I had a typical agency done for you, but then we actually made this course specifically for this one company in mind because mm -hmm. they wanted it. And then he said that product, that course that he calls it a training became so popular. They pivoted and that's their main thing now because it's, it's less work, less interaction, and it's more scalable it with a, a digital course. Sense. So, yeah. you know, I, my whole career started with an online course, mm. uh, you know, dropship <laughs> lifestyle yeah. shout out. And so I love the education revolution. Yeah. It's a next trillion dollar ed industry as college becomes less popular and yeah. online courses, specific knowledge between. So like college will never be able to keep up. Yeah. They just can't. Yeah. They're always going to be old school. Yep. And so the new school is these online courses, the YouTube, and you know specific mastermind groups around specific skills colleges around general knowledge yeah. uh, said hormozy in his other uh, video and and so he was actually talking about um here are the four next billion dollar industries i'd be invested in uh, he's like of course crypto and then he's like um online education what i just said and his third one was remote living mm. and so i was like what fucking that fired me up i was like so he's like you know mobile camera setups um, you know, um, uh, good microphone headsets for taking zoom calls anywhere. Oh, he's like, people yeah. want to travel. People want to be able to work from anywhere. Um, and so he's like remote living tied in with online education. Boom. And then the th fourth one was like storage. People need to store their shit cause they won't have necessarily a, a home mm -hmm. uh, that they're paying. A, a yeah. Well, a lot of people don't want to do this whole travel abroad thing. They want to actually live in their RV and travel the U S or something like yeah. that or, or around Australia or whatever, wherever they're from. That's pretty popular too, but that brings on a whole new slew of problems you got to deal with, especially mm -hmm. internet connectivity, mm -hmm. dealing with the plumbing, dealing with the electricity, dealing with where you're going to go and stay all the time. You know what I mean? But 
Mm -hmm. But for what you get from it, it's worth it, right? Because you're free. You can be anywhere you want to. You can travel down the coast of Oregon this week, and then next week you'll be traveling through the canyons of Utah. And you can see the coolest stuff, and yeah. you still be working on whatever you're working on, you know? Some of the biggest YouTube channels are from people that are, like, off-grid liv living people. Yeah. Um, one, of, one of the guys I used to follow back in the day, his name is Jake Mace, and he's, like, a... a a martial arts instructor that's mm -hmm. how he started but then his youtube channel f like morphed into like a gardening channel because he did a ton of gardening in his backyard mm -hmm. and then during the pandemic he sold his house and everything and him and his girlfriend moved to an off-grid location in canada that like they have to take a boat to across the lake and they built like a yurt and they built all this other stuff and they have a channel now and you look at his channel it's insane he's got like millions of views on every video he puts out wow it's wild, man. Uh, and uh, this is a whole other whole other side of like this lifestyle. Yeah, that you can get into. Yeah, if you there's, want. there's there's off living in another country, but there's also van life and off grid yeah. and just that's why I use the term more just work from anywhere. Yeah, that's <laughs> good. Because yeah. like, my sister started working remotely during the pandemic. Actually, she she always done internet stuff, but during the pandemic, the company specifically told her don't come to work because we don't want COVID here. So yeah, you know. <laughs> Thank you. In so last effects. time I was out there, she's like working, we're like hanging out at the bar or something. She's on her laptop doing some stuff, whatever she does for them. So uh -huh. This is awesome, man. That's, that's the kind of shit I was doing, you know, 10 years ago. And now she's doing it now, finally. Oh, nice. Because she was never like the entrepreneur type. She was like, I'm going to work for somebody, which is fine. Yeah. But, uh, but they can enjoy the same benefits of a remote work, yeah. which is really important. Yeah, there's different. Yeah, there's the work for yourself, such yeah. entrepreneur. And then there's the living abroad. And then there's also just work from anywhere, which comes down to like, like just location freedom. It's like, just freedom, Oh, I want to go to the cabin yeah. this weekend. I want to go to Arizona this weekend. Okay. That's fine. And then there's also schedule freedom, yeah. which is not all remote employees have, but as an entrepreneur, you have that more schedule freedom. Yeah. Um, freedom is important. Freedom. freedom. We got that freedom. Good shit. Trevor Fenner, everybody. Freedom. Thanks e guys paradise. for watching. Hit him up. Appreciate you. E-commerce paradise. You. Living that life. You're listening to the Living That Life Digital Nomad Podcast. Hit the subscribe button on iTunes if you're a boss. And check out the YouTube channel for dope travel videos.